The following presentation is brought to you by the Realm Network. This is Vince Russo's The Brand. It's the third episode of the Brawlin' Alley. This is Jeff Lane. With me, the star maker, Kenny Bolin, and Chris. Chris Bolin joining us again, and we're waiting on our special guest. I don't know, guys. Are we going to have another Vince? Uh, speaking of Vince, where's Vince at? <laughs> I think Tukow went and got a baseball. He, he knows it's playoffs. He did, are on. yeah. He, he, he knows the he, playoffs are on. He right got a now. legitimate baseball. I don't know why I gave that to I, him. It was a bad idea. He got it out last night, too. It sounded like he went bowling. Uh, somewhere well i was trying to find him a lacrosse ball but those are a lot but speaking of vince uh we had an historic meeting vince the prince maya doodle myself well you know vince i want to get into something else because there is another bit of history that's going on on this show that i'm shocked that you guys haven't addressed no what, this what, what is the history? third show we made it to three three well that's history for him that's that's record that's history for him because the last two never made it that yeah far. yeah that's record setting. i mean well well this is kind of like a baseball game only it's only official game in the fifth inning so this will only be official in minute 40 minute 40 <laughs> minute 40 we can stop it'll be an official show and he will have made it longer than than apparently joe cronin and cornet were Having a tweet war the other day. What? Anybody know anything about even that? Your en- even your enemies can't get along. No, my enemy, like- my enemies of my enemies. Can't. Yeah, no, I, I'm blocked by Cornette, so I can't see. Yeah, you're blocked too. Yeah, and you I never were, tweeted him. He just he just, he just randomly one. tweeted me one day. He hoped yeah. that I die and that he's going to block me. <laughs> he hoped. <laughs> he hoped I'll, I'll find the tweet and get it up here for I people heard to a see on something video. About it that he I, I had no idea him. that you had heat with Cornette. Like, no, yeah, he was burying you on one of the shows. What? What did you do? I, I I'm Vince's co-host. That was enough. So he uh he got mad at me because I said that Vince was a great guy. Like he sent. I don't know if that's told you. This. I said he was a great guy. I uh, I haven't put these out, and I won't unless he pisses me off. But uh, <laughs> but there's a series. He's of gonna e- piss you off. I know. That's why I still have them. But there's a series of emails that uh, he basically just runs me into the ground <laughs> because I said that Vince was a good character on television and a hell of a nice guy. And, like that's the crux of his anger. Oh, and uh, I think he wished Chris dead now that I think uh, about it. I'm never going to die. 10,000 years, me and my dog will still be here. Yeah. Well, didn't work, didn't work for my dog. Well, it's only good for 18. I'm a better person than you are. Your dog was morbidly obese. <laughs> well, <laughs> why do you think it was my dog? Yeah, right. Think what I'd look like if I didn't give my dog half my food. What do you think of those rolling graphics in the background there, Jeff? Yeah, uh, I remember you ran out last time. It wasn't long <laughs> enough. <laughs> well, she said put it on a loop, so I put it on a loop, and um, it didn't loop. It didn't loop, <laughs> so we ran out, and there's just pictures of flowers and bridges and all kinds you know, of nice some, little things. Sometimes you need good pictures of bridges. Well, I thought we did, but uh, so Chantel fixed that. Shout out to Chantel. So Jeff, he did your re- he did the recap of Raw and SmackDown. Did you do 205 Live or no? No, no. I can tell you that I have never seen one episode of that show I haven't. I haven't seen it i haven't seen an episode of raw smackdown or any of it in probably close to two years i haven't wow watched it. no i don't know if i should mention this yet or not but at dinner uh when vince and i had dinner we still can't reveal where it was at everything's top secret until we do the show uh the recap show tomorrow until vince is safely on a plane we can't reveal where we had dinner where it was at what we did Things. And let me figure out the timeline, Kenny, because this comes out on this show right here is Wednesday. The show with you and Vince also releases today on Podcast One. So it's the same day, the Raw review. Oh. So that's today. So, so we're good to go then. So we, we are good to go. Raw. Yes. Okay. All right. Yeah. As long as it's Wednesday, because he wanted to be safely landed uh, in the city of his new home. I'm not even sure he's really going to the city that he's telling everybody that he's going to. I think he's just trying to put the old swerve on. You he's know actually he's actually moving to Croatia. He's Croatia. retiring to a beach. He's just well, he's, there'll be good basketball there though, at least for there that. will. Good basketball. Bro, I swear to God, bro. I had to get out of the United <laughs> States. It was getting too hot there, bro. You think he put me over last week on that introduction he gave me? 
when you hear what all went down at dinner. Well, you can talk about it now. I mean, it's it's, it's uh, good to go. Well, I'm going to let him do it. All right. I mean, I don't mind blowing myself. I've done it before. Uh, but I think I Vince guess you know what you like. I think Vince blows me way better than I blow myself. Where's the new bowling alley then? Where can everybody check that out? No, uh, those are whenever we feel like doing them. Uh, it used to be every other week, but you all have given me such a workload over here. See, I used to do for about five years, I did one show a month. The theory behind that was to make them want it, make them, make them be happy I did another one. Because Cornette was doing like eight, 10, or 12 a week or whatever. He was not a week, but a month. The drive through. <clears throat> and then when we guessed on other people's shows, and of course, I guessed on other people's shows quite a bit too. So, I just wanted it to be special when we did one. And then when uh, I went to uh, Joe Cronin, we kept it at once a month because I couldn't deal with him more than more than that. Then when I went to Brian last, I'd made a early verbal agreement to do two a month. And uh, well, <laughs> we did that two. That's all we did. We did two in a month and we were done. Uh, we had a buyout in our, in our contract. And uh, so then the money was on that I wasn't going to last two weeks here. But a lot of people thought maybe the problem was me. I was thinking maybe the problem was me. Oh, the problem's you. Uh, they say I'm a bit petty. Jeff just has the patience of a saint. <laughs> is that what it is? Yeah. We haven't made 40 minutes yet, so we're not going to brag he'll, about anything. He'll yet. be canonized if I have my way. Yeah, well, it would have been. I wanted him to only last one show. <laughs> that was the that was what I was really hoping for is that lame would last one show and then now who's going to be the one to not last any shows? We just <laughs> yeah, agreed to do it and then it never happens. That would have been what would have happened then. <laughs> you bring Honky Tonk on as your your co-host and he just never does a show. <laughs> well, Honky has been known to uh, no show a couple of people here and there. So. He did our show years ago. He did do ours. Fun, uh, yeah. He he's the one that really put me over big in podcasting. He says Kenny Bowen may not have been. Invented podcasting, but he sure as hell perfected it. And whenever hockey couldn't do his show, he had his people reach out to me, or I should I say his person. His, he didn't have people yet. We have people. His person reached out to me and, and asked me if I would do his show. And I said, well, why me out of all the famous WWE stars? He knows why me. And he, he put me over big time, said I was the guy to do it. And he said then, you, he knew you had nothing to do. And knew I had nothing to do. I, I was doing four shows a month back then, for crying out loud. We were on that Dickin network. Oh yeah, the Rob Dickens. The Rob Dickens. What were they called? What were they called? Amped. Amped, Amped Radio. Amped, Amped Radio, Radio. They were called. Yeah. yeah so yeah. shout out to Rob Dickens and Amped Radio, which yeah. uh, I think they're defunct now. I Are they know. defunct? I well, I'm, I don't think Dickens with them anymore. I think it was Dickens Network. It probably was. I thought he was on a big time network. Turned out it was his network. Next thing we're going to find out is the podcast one is just a guy to pay. <laughs> well, ho hopefully Disco isn't dicking us, but I got a I got a DM out to him to make sure he got the link. So All we'll right. see if he joins All us. All right. But yeah, it, you guys went and saw Vince. Yeah. You had yeah. dinner with him. I've we heard uh, um, he sent me a text message that, that I got to hear what you did, something about the bill. So I don't even know this story yet. I don't know if you would uh, would be talking about this on the Raw show, but what, what's this about the well, bill? I will. If, if Vince shows up for the Raw show and he says he is. Well, he kind of has to. That one's his show. So. That one's yeah. his show, so yeah. we'll see if he shows or not. Uh, what have uh, Prince, you want to lay the groundwork and I'll fill in the gaps. Well, am I going through the whole story of how this came to be? And Go ahead. Why? Go All ahead. Right. We got so, time to kill until... Until Glenn shows Until up. Glenn shows up. So uh, basically, for the show he told me to come to at eight o'clock. So for the uh, the long story short, one of Jim Cornette's favorite dining establishments in the world is a place in Evansville, Indiana, called Rocka Bar Pizza. And after eating there, I now know why it's very, very good. By the way, we have an empty box in the oven. If you want to use that as a prop later, I might. I might bring that, or you maybe you should say that one for the raw show just All to right. demonstrate. Well, we can um, do that. So he, when he was working for the WWF in Connecticut, I'm sorry, the WWF in Connecticut, I got a little fast there. WWE. WWE. Um, he uh, would have them freeze five pizzas and ship them to Connecticut uh -huh. for him to heat up in his oven. That's how much he loves this place. Hasn't Rockwell. been in years. No. Uh, so actually, wasn't the guy that was all this controversy was surrounding that he was going to pay? Didn't he? Used to yes. Pay? He yes. used to get that guy. They, right. they used to pick him up rock bar pizzas because his family couldn't afford to eat. In a, so when the Cornets would go there, which is the only charitable thing I've ever known Jimmy to do. Well, it was Thelma. Yeah, well, Thelma did it. Oh. But uh, his mother would pull over. Yeah, because Jimmy wouldn't buy it. He's making 90 bucks a week back then. Yeah. Uh, but they would pull over, and they would get those family rock -a bar pizzas when they were in Evansville. So apparently that's worth murder for hire in the state of Indiana. 
So uh, <laughs> history for you. Yeah. So we can't determine where we're going to go eat. We're trying to figure out a good place in Evansville. Vince doesn't know anything about up there. I don't know anything about up there. Dad goes, well, you know what? I know one place. <laughs> so he gives him a call. Yep. Uh, works a little bit of magic, makes some arrangements. We- Shout out to Tyler at Rocka Bar. I promised him we was going to put him over big on the podcast. Yeah, yeah. Shout so, out to Tyler at the Rocka Bar East. Rocka Bar North. North, excuse me. Rocka Bar North. I had three more shots at it. Yeah. Rocka Bar North. You sure it's North? I'm sure it's North. Rocka Bar North. I thought it was East. You sure? I'm sure. Okay. Uh, in, in Evansville, Indiana. Great home cooked food. Everything is just fantastic. Real fresh. Uh, we ran up a bill. I think it was like $136 for all six of us. With tax, we were floating around 150 Yeah. Or it was five of us. It was all five of us. Yeah. Uh, and uh, all of it on the house, complimentary. They were great people. Great guys. Easy, easy to do business with. Jimmy's never eaten there for a day in his life. So how'd you get it on the house? That must be what he wanted to, to tell me about. How'd you pull that one off? Well... Basically, I showed up with a pair of uh, red beets because I figured some red beets would go over big in Indiana. And uh, one autographed book that we forgot to sign. So he, he's got my... Uh, now, had he had his choice, he wanted some blue Notre Dame beets. But we'd already left, and I figured that was a Hoosier town, not a Notre Dame town. And Bloomington's not all that far away. So... The Evansville Purple Aces, but I was out of purple headphones. The, uh, is so that, that actually went, a thing? Oh yeah, yeah. The, that's where Vince went to school. He went. No, actually, no. He didn't go. To, he didn't go there. He went to um. U. It's USI now. It was uh Southern era. It was uh Indiana State, I believe, when he went there. Oh, he yeah, went so, to he went to the Sycamores. Yeah, uh, out west. Yeah, the college out west. Evil Purple Aces. No, no he didn't go there. I mean, I'll just screw up my story. <laughs> Ah, oh, well, your story I've told, itself, I've told I you I'll never change my story because I may have changed the ending or in some cases, the university. Now, did Papa Russo join uh, you guys? Papa Russo Papa was there. Papa Russo was there. Tell him about when we pulled up in the parking lot for us. They couldn't get over. My dad, <laughs> for whatever reason, I keep trying to tell him not to do it. He yeah. has these god awful magnets on his car. He's got three of them on each side. <laughs> you see, Lane already knows. He's already bearing it. You, you've seen the pictures, right? Didn't I send you the pictures? You sent me the pictures. Yeah, I know what you're talking about. So, Insert them on this show if you'd like. So he knows, he knows they look like shit. No, aware. no, no. He's grinning. I think he liked them. No, no, he's aware. They look why, actually, they, why? Look, they look worse than shit. If I were to put them on <laughs> Hey, 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 podcast. Sorry, 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 sorry. PG-13, Crying out PG-13, loud. PG-13. PG-13. Jesus. Sorry. Uh, you got to remind me of the stuff. <laughs> we did. Well, you got to keep, ago. You gotta keep doing it. Uh, oh, um, I grew up in a wrestling locker room. What do you want from me? Uh, we all did. <laughs> no, you got there when you were like 27. Um, <laughs> I've been in the locker room long before then. How do you think me and Lawler got to be buddies? Um, Never so, mind. <laughs> I was about to say, I don't think you want to. Uh, yeah. Talk I'm about a big red and talk favors. And big Max. <laughs> big Max and. Something to Tights. do with it. It's like about Harvey Weinstein. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, Jimmy Hart. <laughs> all of the gentries at once. Um, I didn't know there were that many. <laughs> would have agreed to it. No. Uh, but they look terrible, and they just look. The them. gentries. <laughs> well, they're not holding up so are good. The either. gentries are the magnets. The magnets. <laughs> the gentries don't look that hot either. Jeff, if you don't know who the gentries Jimmy Hart's are, holding up pretty good. If you don't know who the gentries are, it was Jimmy Hart's band that he toured with. I mean, uh, had a big hit called Hang On Sloopy. That's a weird. I've never heard. I've never heard. What? That well, you better. Uh, if I had my Alexa plugged in right now. And, thank, be, and thank God he doesn't. Thank God. <laughs> no, we'd be playing that right now. Uh this show is a disorganized mess. Has anybody ever told Well, us if that? Glenn would show up, maybe we could restore some order. He said he'd be ready at eight. And then I said, no, the prince is at the mall. Then, all right, at nine. All right, K. We, can we do it at nine, Glenn? K, whatever the hell. I guess that means okay. In you're, a lot of you're the guy who, do, who does nothing but type in like 1999. Text I can to handle you. an O in front of a K. Barely. I didn't say how well. Lol. Um, so yeah, the uh, the gentries. But he has these magnets and they're god awful. And I keep telling them, look, your car looks ridiculous like this. I'm gonna post it on Reddit and people are gonna make fun of you. And he will not change it to him. It is just the greatest thing because it's all basically the same color. Like it's not, but it's it's kind of the same color. Kinda. Yeah. It's so close. It's it's <laughs> it, they're shades of white, I guess. Yeah. Eggshell, you know, all we'll white. See, we'll see, the car is pearl white, but the magnets are whiter than the pearl white. Are they're gloss white? 
Yeah, yeah, kind of gloss. Well, I'm gonna put the I'm gonna put the picture up and and everybody watching this. Leave your feedback in the comments. What do you think? Yeah, of these tell me what yeah. you think. Magnets or no magnets? As he and Vince Russo get ready to drop the hottest rap album of 1996. Uh-huh. No, 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 no. We've decided it's going to be Kenny and Vinny sing the rap hits of all, uh, all the rap hits of the 60s and 70s. That'll be the Sugar Hill King rapper's delight. So I got to work with Vince on that song. A hip, a hop, a hip it in a hip. That would, that would probably. Hip, hip, hop. I you don't know, stop rocking. Do you know that song? I, I do know the Sugar Hill Gang. Probably I, better than I do. I have breathed. Um, but yes, that will, if you two do. It, Jeff hasn't even heard a hang on Sloopy. So let's not be counting on him knowing rapper's delight. I know rappers delight, but I couldn't. I could not name a second Sugar Hill Gang song. <laughs> Neither could anyone else. Neither could the Sugar Hill Gang. And and the thing about it is, is that that song was so big, you thought they had stumbled into a second one. Especially because there wasn't much competition in rap at the time. Uh, they were really one of the first. They were the, they were the guys. They yeah, should have had all the rappers. Yeah, they they should have owned the market. They had the market cornered, and they kind of. And then they just dropped the ball. They, they didn't drop the mic. Or they well, that was back in that line. Maybe dance. they did drop the mic. That was back in the line dance. You ain't got the rap. mic. You can't rap. My name's Mike, MC Mike, or and then he had MC Hammer, Fab Five Freddy. And then for some reason, everybody wanted to be known as MC. Well, doesn't that confuse everybody when there's thousand MCs? Uh, it's better than MC when, Scat Cat. It, nobody's remembered MC Scat Cat. That's, Me and uh, you. I know. And I'm, I remember MC Light. MC Light. Yeah. MC, uh, who's that? It's just another 90s, late 80s rapper. Now, Heavy oh. D was just Heavy D. He was he, not an MC. No, he right? was not MC Heavy D. He's dead. He's, heavy, what, he's what, heavy dead now. What does it take to qualify for MC status? Uh, I swore we never be a microphone coordinator. <laughs> is, is that what it is? Um, no. Yeah, um, yeah, hell, Jeff could do that. He, 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 is, he is MC Jeff Lane. Yeah. Who else was there? When everybody became Lil, that's when I think rap kind of. <laughs> Lil Bow Wow, Lil Kim. <laughs> everybody Lil in my Boosie. house is named Lil. One of my Asian girlfriends named Lil, 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 Lil Jenny. Are we really going to get into the Asian girlfriend crap? Well, I've got seven. No, you have a problem. <laughs> yeah, the problem is i got seven Asian girlfriends. You I don't ha- know which one. To, I've got it down to the top three. You have 99 problems and bitches are seven. You might have to beep that. I, don't I got 99 Asians. There's a, I got 99 problems, but Asians ain't one. I don't no, know. Asians are okay. all of them. Asians um, are all the problems. But And her daughter's Lil Kimmy. Crime. So I got a little Jimmy. There's already been a little Kim. You got to get another one. Little Kimmy. So that's why no, I'm a Kimmy. No, plague. No, plague. Little Kimmy. Cancer. I've never come up with little Lena though. She's never been little Lena. Which is weird. Little e, little EJ. No, nah, didn't work. Little Kimmy. Little Jenny did. Saw so you hitting on Oscar. <laughs> <laughs> I blew out the mic there. Sorry about that. I did. That's too. good timing. That's good timing. <laughs> Yeah. I, I've been hitting on her since the day she showed up in NXT, and it ain't paid off yet. I've been hitting on Shinsuke since he showed up, and it ain't paid out. That's that's what put you out of the chair. I said, yeah, I'm really behind Shinsuke. Not that way, and he fell out of the chair. What do you think of Kyrie Hojo? I couldn't think of her name where I was going to talk about her, and I was going to hit on her, too, but I can never think of her name. Yeah, I think she's Kyrie Sane in WWE, but she was Kyrie Hojo. Kyrie Sane? Yeah, Kyrie Hojo in Japan. Okay, I need, a, I, I need a link. She's got that I, elbow I, drop. I did put her elbow drop over, but I couldn't it's a think great of elbow drop. As a matter of fact, Jeff saved me on the name. He knew the name, because yeah. Jeff knows everything. That's why yeah, I wouldn't go that far. He steers the ship, too. Jeff, who was your favorite member of the Italian Connection? Come on. I know you know. <laughs> the Italian Connection. Yeah. <laughs> Irrelevant Japanese. <laughs> I thought you were talking about Tracy Smothers. Oh, no, it was the FBI. It was the FBI. Okay. Yes. Now, Tracy uh, Smothers. Yes. I, I learned a lot from Tracy Smothers many years ago. He was one of the first people that taught me anything about professional wrestling. I miss that guy. Tra- of, Tracy something else. One of my favorite, yeah. uh, I told the story last night. One of my favorite Tracy Smothers memories is he came into OBW to work with us because uh, I think Jesse Bell was supposed to be his daughter and then wasn't. I, I don't know, but. That, that got confusing fast, but he came in to do a show with us with her and Nikki Knuckles. <laughs> and they were and pause while everyone goes, Who? Yeah, pause while our audience will know Nikki Knuckles. Yeah, she was ain't on, gonna do you no good to Google it. You're still gonna come up with she another. was on TNA. Come on, um, really? I, yeah. st- I still bet you get another when you put type in Mickey the Knuckles. Um, she was there. Um, <laughs> so she also had Jack's son's kid too yeah which is weird jack, jack black. who jack black what yeah oh oh that's right yeah yeah, yeah. so yeah uh, there you go that, that's some terrible breeding <laughs> so <laughs> you can do that i love jack so uh, i like jack <laughs> so uh don't like jack's son breeding with mickey knuckles though so he uh, i'll be a log and so tracy comes is. in and uh mickey and the, the other one i can't think of her name now we're feuding with a black woman named josie and out of the blue <laughs> josie walks up to tracy in the back for an angle 
and Tracy doesn't call anything. They don't go over what they're going to do. He just takes his Confederate flag and shoves her into a wall and starts choking her with the Confederate flag. And Adam, Seemed okay at the time. And Adam Revolver looks at me in front of the monitor and goes, he's the who, guy who, who plays a, looks like a racist wife beater. But he's not. But he's, he's, they he's say a, he's not. He's a good liberal guy. No one's ever seen him do it. He, he, uh, he looks at me and goes, and he's the guy who's booking. He goes, did I just let a man choke a black woman with a Confederate flag on my show? I said, yeah, you did, buddy. Yeah, you did. Ratings. Yeah, yeah. And what's that bitch? Trump wouldn't mind. Trump would support that shit. I mean, stuff. Didn't he say controversy <laughs> creates cash? Beep, beep. My favorite Tracy story. We were doing a show in Vincennes, Indiana. And Tracy was wrestling a, a buddy of mine, Zachary Springgate. And the match is about to start. Tracy flags me down, calls me down to the ring. I'm not on the show or anything. I'm just, you know. Tracy. He goes, yeah, he, he goes, <laughs> Jeff, Tracy, Jeff. Tracy hot dog in the match. <laughs> Jeff, what's the finish, Jeff? <laughs> I forgot the finish. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I can see Tracy doing that. I really could. And he probably really forgot to finish. <laughs> yes, yeah, so I told Someone him right there. Him. You made side like a <laughs> Did you give him the finish? Yeah, I gave him the correct finish and he nailed it. <laughs> it, it was funny. We had a guy oh, come in. Oh boy. <laughs> we had a guy come into OBW who was uh Cornet Cornet wasn't booking that show, was he? <laughs> who was doing jobs for us and I was doing commentary over his match. He was working one of my guys and they were putting over he was trained by Tracy Smothers. And I said, You mean Tracy Smothers put down the bottle long enough to train somebody? Oh, we got on him bad. I know yeah. he did. No, and just, wasn't very nice yeah, either. You know, but it's you know, you're just getting heat. It's you know, he's a baby face, you're trying to bury he's him. He's the illegitimate stepdaughter. This guy like comes to the back just in a fury that I besmirched the good name of Tracy Smothers. <laughs> Tracy it's like Smothers. it's it's a work. You morons. morons. Ain't say morons around here. Everyone denies they said it. General or secretary or whatever his name is. Jeff, catch me up because I don't know what happened with this. What happened between Stevie Ray and Chantel? Because I heard that there was some controversy. Oh, my. That got ugly. Well, it's I yeah, th yeah, everything she put on her show at Russo'sBrand.com. It's on the same YouTube channel. But Vince and Stevie were going back and forth, and Stevie said some things about China. But he was talking about China, the character. So, so when Vince told the story <laughs> to to ham it up between him and Stevie, he told the story that Stevie Ray was taking shots at China, the person. Okay, okay. so mm -hmm. so Chantel took exception to that and and uh, made some comments about Stevie Ray on her show, the Weekend Freak Show, I'm and sorry. then Stevie Ray, when he, he had Vince on the show, just freaking went off and blasted her every name you could think of in the book that's derogatory <laughs> he, yeah he, he said it to her this freak show individual tried to call stevie ray out yeah there she is you ever seen her before or he i don't even know what it is put that picture back up i want everybody to see this face everybody and i want someone out there and look who she's right beside. I think Vince Russo put this I think Vince Russo put this ingrate. I think Vince Russo put this trans This person should be auditioning for an Ed Wood movie. A movie called Glenn or Glenda. Because I don't know what she is. Now, yeah, he didn't pull any punches, and then she re she responded again on her show. It's pretty entertaining. Now, was Vince on Stevie's show, or was Stevie on <laughs> Vince's show? Both, but when it happened with Chantel, it was on Stevie's show. Okay. okay. Yeah, yeah. Is Stevie part of the brand or part of uh No, I guess he came across her video just going through our YouTube and oh, watched it. So, okay. yeah. Big, big fan. Big fan. Big, big fan Stevie of Chantel. Stevie Ray, big fan of Chantel. We can, yeah. uh, we can now officially put that out there that Stevie Ray watches all of Chantel's videos. Yeah, she got a lot of um, uh, notoriety from, from that I, episode. I, yeah, so, I heard about it, but I haven't been able to catch up and see. Uh, I'll probably do something to address yeah, it. If I, I, I almost got involved. I, I didn't like Stevie saying those things about I, Chantel. I know that I Vince did not nice. seem pleased about it. I, I can say that. Vince seemed rather bothered. So. Well, I, I'm I'm taking it all with a grain of salt because you never know with these characters how much is uh, how much is uh, just, they're just hamming it up. You know what I mean? Hell's not that good of an actor. She was really upset. Says that uh, Glenn might be <laughs> popping in here. Hey, there he is. Oh, well, look who's here. There we go. Glenn, welcome to the Brawling Alley. Yes. How you guys doing? Doing well, great. Sorry, I'm late. 
I'm kind of late. I actually like uh, when you get at five o'clock. I want I want to do it earlier, and then um, I was sitting just on my computer, and I just I I just passed out watching the <laughs> <laughs> just like went from watching the game today. Already. So I was, I was watching the football game. I just passed out you watching the football game. You weren't watching that. So now I'm up. I'm ready. I'm ready to. I'm ready to roll here in the bullet. The bullet out. Ready to roll. You weren't watching that dolphin game today, where maybe you fell asleep at the end of that game when that interception happened uh, there late in the game when it looked like Atlanta had it. Yeah, it's a typical Falcons loss. They always be. They always lose to teams that are not so, like they're not so. You know, they play the level of competition. The Dolphins so. have not scored a touchdown since the Nixon administration, but yet somehow we get a couple <laughs> yeah, of scores. Right. From you guys, the. Should be Super Bowl champions. Well, let's go ahead and say it. What crazy, it. right? Should be the Super Bowl champs. And I would definitely uh, for you guys. This is, I don't even want to talk about it. Because <laughs> I mean, all my all my friends all my friends think I run my mouth all the time about the Fal- about the Falcons, and I don't. I don't. Like if we win, I'm quiet. If yeah. we lose, I'm quiet. But if we lose, I have to hear from all my friends. Yeah, yeah. Because I, I, I make fun of their teams when they lose. Our former audio technician here, Marty. Yeah. Uh, what was Marty's last Martin name? Richardson, yeah. He Martin was Richardson. Die, die hard. hard. Die hard. If, if you so, see him outside of a Falcons jersey, it's a strange Well, I occurrence. blocked him for something stupid he said here a while back. I'm being petty again. You, and I blocked him right. for something stupid he said. So I don't even get to rib him anymore if we do beat him. You were an impossible. I, can I unblock him and then rib him and then block him back? Can that's, I do, that's a personal choice, I guess. Could do yeah, that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Glenn, it's a pleasure to finally have you on the show. I've been looking forward to doing this for a while. Uh, I've been trying to catch cool. him up on some of your uh, career highlights here because WCW was a very dirty word in our house. In the yeah, 90s, so. yeah. Back then, it was like, well, well, Cornette, he laughed. It was a dirty word. Yeah. So. At that point, it became profane. So, um, right. Okay. He was unaware that you actually spent any time in Memphis, and I, I was, didn't know that. Yeah, I was just reading about that a little while ago. You did a brief on there. Five weeks. Five weeks. Did um, uh, Raven got me a job over there? He was working over there, so uh, sure, that's like about two before years. he was Raven. So I was um, he did brought me in for a while for like five weeks. I was really green. Yeah. Now, what was your Back what was your too? Disco Inferno it was the first it's time fun. I really did it on TV. Oh. Uh, yeah, I did it like regularly, you know. What year was that? Because I'm trying to figure out how the hell I missed it, but I could have been living in Atlanta. 90, uh, 94, maybe? Yeah, I was in uh, Atlanta, Nashville, and then back to Louisville by then. Went through a divorce, all that good stuff. I moved, right. I moved to Atlanta for a period of time and was doing uh, WCW. Well, they were called, were they WCW then? Um, when Jimmy was there in the 89, 90? I think they were just converting to WCW at that point. Yeah, that I, know, I know Crockett was still there. They they were doing the Crockett Cup and all that. And and uh, who, who's that country singer that uh, everyone said smelled real bad to perform at the shows that Dusty Rhodes loved so much? I, I don't know. Um, can you say the name, Disco? I know you're bound to know it. Um, God damn it. Big, big country guy. It was uh, all, He would be on tour with the Great American Bash. David Allen Cole, does that, does that ring a bell? David Allen Cole, yeah. I mean, I, mean, I hope a, he ain't a real good friend. Oh, right, right, right. Yeah, David Allen Cole, yeah. A lot of complaints said he didn't smell real good. <laughs> that's, that's terrible. <laughs> it came from a lot of the boys. Poor David Allen Cole. So, wow. I don't know. Why was WCW a uh, naughty word in your house? Well, because then uh, Jimmy was with Smokey and then had infiltrated the WWE. And then, uh, then of course, Hall and Nash went down there. And then, of course, Russo eventually was there. And, and a lot of it was his personal issues with Bischoff. He, uh, and, of course, Bischoff, yeah. It, I think when I was a kid, I was wearing an NWO shirt at an OVW show and I think, about 97, 98. And he went off on me in the parking lot. And I was, like, 12. Yeah. And I just got ripped apart. And it's like, over a T-shirt, you know? <laughs> Why Chris didn't whip his butt then, I don't know. I, sh- I, I know you could have. I could have. I didn't feel like I was permitted to. Like I felt like that was off limits to attack Cornette. Now it seems inevitable. But um, Disco, did you have any interactions with Cornette over, over the years? Did you all ever cross paths or work together or anything like that? Briefly uh, in TNA, um, maybe a couple yeah. shows. And, uh, I, I got a, I, I always got along with him. Oh God! I think you know. I I, I got along with him. He's he was a uh, he he Cor, Cornet is um. Uh, Has anybody I, seen mine? He's he's one of the, he's one of those guys that um that I've found out. You know, especially like some of the things he's he's uh, said about me in the past that this, he this, has a selective selective memory. Your camera is selective memory over there, huh? I said you guys no, are drinking over there. We're gonna have to get no, no, I was, I was readjusting my uh, my pillow here. The yeah. um the cor- cornet has a selective memory. Yeah. Okay, like what <laughs> he'll do is is he'll 
he'll he'll get the t- he'll get the time and place and location right. Yeah. Like you know, I remember sitting catering really at the show talking to him and everything, but like the content of the conversations will not be accurate. You, you know, it's like one of the you know, he'll he'll sound accurate. Like <laughs> yes. he'll sound like he knows what you're talking about, but he'll just complete be completely full of it, you know? Because yeah. like he's I mean, I've had never had a problem with it, but of course since I'm a Russo's friend, you know, he'll he'll just Take take shots at me, I guess, for for for, for no other, no other reason whatsoever than other than that. But I specifically remember, um, when sitting in um, uh, the the booking room, just just the, the where we had the the booking room at the um, at TNA uh, in in one of the buildings there, where, where it was like the office, like like this room we used to have the booking meetings in. And I'll never forget me specifically sitting there telling him. About like the story, like like how I came up with these uh some of the, my these old gimmick names like the Visible Man and you know like like so and and I and I pitched him the exact same way that I pitched in my uh kayfabe commentaries DVD just the exact, I, I I'm telling the story the exact same way I told I told Sean Oliver the story okay. that basically you know, these, these were these are things we 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 joke around in the booking meetings and stuff and like I never pitched them serious right right well Cornette will tell the story he'll repeat that story. And he he should know that I you know that I you know, I told him that these these are gimmicks you know this is just a work right he repeat the stories like like I was telling like I really actually wanted to book the Invisible Man that I wanted to have uh, Martians come and everything and I'm like like the, the funniest thing about it is is that I, I sit there say like okay if that's the case all right <laughs> the way you're pitching the story is is that either. Um, I thought you were such a mark. Okay, <laughs> I was pitching this story to you, like I was pitching an angle that would include a CGI special effect that would like the, the, the like the Martian invasion story starts out with Mike Tenay sitting there at the at the, at the uh, announcer's desk and two antenna pop out of his head like a Martian. Okay, like like that that's part of the angle, like like the joke. He's pitching. He tells the story like I was pitching that to him for real. I'm like, dude, if, if you think I was pitching that to you for real, then, then you're saying to me that you didn't think that I have much respect for your intelligence because I was trying to work you over then. You know, it's so like, like either way, the story is he's, he's either full of crap right. or he's just uh, just trying to make others look bad when he tells the stories. You know? yeah. I, I've known Jimmy, obviously, for a little over 41 years, and I'm going to tell you my problem with that story. Number one, Jimmy would be classy enough to try and actually book real Martians and real aliens. Look to mommy. Number two, he wouldn't do it because trans is a bitch. Right. Yeah. 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 Oh, God. You got to feed them and who the hell knows what they eat. Yeah. And, uh, that Jesus. would be why Jimmy would just back out of that altogether. Between trans, not knowing what they eat, uh, can they live at the at the uh, Red Roof Inn? I mean, I don't know. Right. How are they going to handle right. it? Sure. Can they actually still work? In Earth's Will the Galaxians show up and really just get pissed and have a shoot? You know, the Galaxians. Yeah. Interesting though, because this is something that I've run into since we started working. <laughs> like when we were with Cornette, people would just kind of take what we say and they'd go with it. But since we got involved with Vince, people now want to pick apart everything that we say, which is fine with me. <laughs> That's I, cool. I've been around my entire life. I, I know what I'm talking about. I've been around my whole life. See, there, you day. Go. <laughs> there you go, Glenn. You. <laughs> he was born at a very early age. I can. I There's can three you. of us that have been around our whole lives. Um, my okay. doodle. <laughs> Her whole life. Uh, my girlfriend wants me to tell you, by the way, that we named our cat after one of your uh, characters. <laughs> you did, uh, they Artie, did. Artie Fact is the name of our cat. So uh, he forgot he named his cat. He yeah, forgot that was one like, of his Artie, cat. Artie Fact, one of the archaeologists' tag team. But these people, they want to, uh, they want to look at Mark. wrestling. I am. I'm a total Mark. I admit it. Um, they want to look at wrestling as being so much deeper than I think it actually is. You have guys like Rip Rogers, who Jimmy says is this genius, who obsesses over the structure of matches, how matches are going to be put together and how they're going to be worked. And when you watch Raw and SmackDown, all these guys that he trained, which is the Ortons, the Cenas, the uh, the Batistas, that whole generation of guys. The Lesners. The Lesners. Less Lesner because of the MMA stuff. But yeah. the matches all flow the same. If you look at how guys feed in for chair shots. He never they... listened or retained anyway. No, he, he wasn't just a caveman. But if you look at how they feed in for chair shots, how they bump, how they sell, how they get up, it's all this, this Rip Rogers phase. And... I think it's created the sameness, but that's what they like. They like this overly choreographed, overly rehearsed, overly similar product. And it mm-hmm. forms the hell out of me to try to watch that. Yeah, right. the wrestling part. I've always been a promo guy. Even back in the days of Memphis, I tuned in for the promos. And if I didn't get 
three or four or five great promos a show, I felt cheated because all the matches, you know, uh, no offense to, to wrestlers. Cause I, I did it amateur wrestling and, and it, it can get boring if you don't mix it up a little bit. If the characters aren't a little different, that, that's one reason I like Enzo Amore. He's different. Um, he, there's nothing like him. Uh, he, he's certainly not the greatest wrestler that ever lived, uh, but at least he's different. He, he's something different to catch the eye. Uh, you were, were certainly quite different. There wasn't a whole lot uh, out there like you. And, uh, and when The Undertaker came to be, and uh, then, of course, when Stone Cold Steve Austin got his deal rolling with Stone Cold Steve Austin, I mean, you, they were characters. To me, they were driven by character. To me, you just you got to have something different throughout the course of the show because there's only, only so many lockups and takedowns and and uh, figure fours and all that stuff that you can see during the course. And I, and the, the one thing Disco I hated, uh, and it might just be me, was when the predictable finish came to be. I grew up watching Jerry Lawler, Bill Dundee, Joe LaDuke, Jimmy Viant, all these guys, and there wasn't really any such thing as the the so-called predictable finish the Lawler might move Lawler might win his match with fire might win it with a pile driver might win it with a fist off the middle rope because God knows he wouldn't go into the top rope um or he just might knock you out in the in the corner of the ring with one punch I mean you just never knew and now we're waiting for everybody's predictable finish and now of course uh, we have all these guys that have to kick out of everybody's predictable finishes and uh and when you get these uh fatal four ways fatal five ways you might see 15, 20 finishes during the match. And of course, everybody's got to kick out. And then God knows. Well, this, well, the, win, but. well here's, here's the thing. You, guys, you, guys are, you state the obvious. Like, yeah. like this, this is this is what happens today. And this is this is the way. And here's the thing, though, is that um, like when I grew up watching wrestling, I uh, I got like seven hours of wrestling on the Joe Pettacino wrestling block on Channel 36 mm-hmm. Atlanta on Saturday nights right. from 8 o'clock to 3 o'clock in the morning. Had, w, uh, had the US, w, uh, WWE or WWF back then on USA Network and on WWR. WR, the USA Network had the Madison Square Garden shows. Right. I had our, the, the TBS Superstation mm-hmm. shows. I was watching ten to eleven hours of wrestling, and then oh, the Monday night, the Tuesday night Titans mm-hmm. and stuff. You know, fifteen you, you hours of stuff. Week. So I'm the same way. I would, you know, it's hard to watch. I'd mm-hmm. fast forward through a lot of it. I'm five, five mm-hmm. mostly fast forward to watch a wrestling show. You fast forward through the matches. I want to fast through the body of the matches, stop at the finish, see what happens, see you won, and you listen to the promos. Yeah, there you go. Yes, I like, once told like Jimmy he, Cornette that Jim Crockett owed me $399. He said, why is that? I said, because he wore the heads out on my new uh, VCR speeding through his crappy show. And uh, Jimmy never did relay that message to Crockett, by the way. And I never did right. get $399. But yeah, it was back in the days of videotape and... Thank God for speed search and the wired remote back then. And then eventually the wireless remote came in. And now, of course, DVRs. And now they got that great thing, Glenn. I don't know if you use yours or not. called the 15-minute skip. And that's when you know the crap promo is coming up. That there's just no way you can set through 15 minutes of it. Or it's a match you know for sure is going to go 15 minutes. Well, one push of a button and that match is over. And let's move on to the next one. And I wear mine out, especially on three hours and 12 minutes of Raw. Yeah. Well, I, I watched. I found, I found a couple links uh, on YouTube where a guy like actually takes the time out to condense it uh, into a 13-minute version of, of the show, just with every single good thing you want to see one after the other. So I don't even have to fast forward. That's so I literally can watch. I literally can watch the show in 13 minutes. Man, you know, like on, you know, like on like NFL Network, they'll have like yeah, a 13-minute replay of the game. Well, the sh- shorter ones sometimes. You go, you go in the on-demand. They'll yeah. have like a 13-minute. They'll just show all the plays you'd want to see. You know what yeah, I'm saying? Right, and you just watch it. Instead. And that's that's that, that's your viewing experience. Like yeah, you right, know, like I right, I, I, right. I haven't watched, including pay per views. I haven't watched a wrestling show from start to finish in six seven years. Chris, how you know, how, how dedicated just, to Raw were we back in the days of uh? And let's say it's Stone Cold Steve Austin, Rock, Triple H, back in the Attitude Era. Probably through the invasion. Okay. Era. And then pay-per-views. We would never miss a pay-per-view. If we didn't have a pay-per-view party at our house, we were at one. Yeah. yeah. Haven't done that. Like you said, the timeline's almost matched with us. I bet it's been seven years. It's been longer since than we've done anything. Pe- people will call, uh, Kenny, did you watch such and such? Did you watch Mania? No. Are you going to? I don't know. I only heard like one match I cared to see. Mania to me has just become an overproduced, over budgeted 
disaster. I mean, most of the Raws, even the crappy ones today, are better than Mania, in my opinion. Yeah. Well, seven hours well, is just, you can't sit for a wrestling show for, last year's was seven hours. Like, oh this, this, this is one thing, uh, this is one thing that people don't, don't realize. And when you talk about like WrestleMania pay-per-views and stuff and all that, is that we still call them pay-per-views. But no, one, the, but no the, one that, that model, the, the model of what a pay-per-view actually is, is completely changed uh -huh. when, when it went on the network. Okay. Cause all these shows are, are a three hour block of wind block of a three hour window of time on your inclusive nine ninety nine that you pay for for your network months. Right. Okay. Is it then that's all it is. So when people complain about the pay-per-views and say, I say, dude, I go, you're not paying nothing for them. No. Yeah. <laughs> no. I go, they're not like, it's not like they're not booking these, like they're trying to get forty nine ninety nine from you out of well, your pocket no, each month. Like, like, and, and the the, the effort that you see, they charge sixty nine seventy nine dollars. Well, right, but the, but the effort you see from from the WWE now is like is is the effort you would give if like you know you don't but like you're not having to struggle to try to to try to make money. No. All you're doing is struggling just to put the show on. And, and like it's, it's funny today. It's like worried about someone else taking your viewers either, even even though they've dropped. Right. From, what eight million to lucky to get two million on some shows? Yeah, right? I was trying yeah, to yeah, exactly. So it's like that. That so that's you know. So they we could sit there like you know like when we, we critique the show we sit, you know we bitch and we complain about the paper. I mean like guys, this is you you're not paying for nothing special here. Yeah, you know you're paying you're paying for it. So don't expect anything special. In the NXT okay, the, the, the pay per view. The, the, they they barely do a job promoting the pay per views. The, most of the most of the promotion of the pay per view is done online. With uh, the um, the people hoping out uh, who like wondering who's gonna have like if two two good workers are they gonna have a really good match? Yeah, you know nobody nobody talks about the storylines. Nobody talks about this. All they care about is like, bro, rest, wrestling today is so simplistic. Like if you, like if like this this uh, you look at these online um, or these these indie organizations that two good indie workers will be having a match yeah. and everybody will, uh, everybody be talking up. Oh, this would be a great match. You know, and then and there's no TV. But every time, like, wow, what what a great match this is going to be! It's going to be a four star, five star match. It's like, dude, it's like you can you can only sell that type of like a that like like watching wrestling like that. You can only sell to a niche audience. Yeah, our critics. That's it. Wrestling critics that want to sit there and they they don't they don't watch the show for the uh, suspension of disbelief. Mm -hmm. Okay, they don't suspend their disbelief. All they care about is okay. They have two performers. They don't care which guy wins or loses because they don't cheer for the they, they don't cheer cheer the baby faces or boo the heels and everything. All they care about is uh basically how good the match is going to be and you know whether they and like how they're going to rate did, it. You know, did so they, did they miss an obvious spot so they can call it out? Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. You know, so it's like and you the, the, it. The, <laughs> the, yeah the, the way we watch wrestling now has just completely changed yeah and like all people care about is how good the you know how good the matches that's it glenn can you imagine that's, if, they don't uh, care about. that's all they care about you know glenn being as you did uh some time in memphis and obviously worked quite a bit with uh dusty Rhodes, can you imagine if dusty Rhodes and uh, who, who was his biggest uh rival uh flair flair uh, you imagine oh the horse the horse yeah. one that's the biggest rub. Yeah. If you can you imagine if Dusty and Flair were having a match, or if in Memphis Jerry Lawler and Bill Dundee were having a match, and just somewhere in the in the somewhere during the course of the match, the crowd started yelling, "This is awesome," or "You deserve it." <sighs> I mean, it, bro, it's it's terrible. Would have lost his mind, and, I, and I'm pretty sure Dusty would have too. Yeah. And Flair and Flair and uh, Dusty may have just left the ring, and just went to the back, and, until the crowd come to their mm -hmm. center. Um, you, they won't let them sit. Even when I was smart to the business and I felt I pretty much knew everything that was going on and then fast learned I didn't. But even when I thought I knew, I went there for the disbelief. I went there to root for Lawler over Dundee. Uh, and, and he was, yes, he was the heel. Uh, I might've been one of the first ever heel fans ever who only went to, and I can't say I rooted for the heels. I rooted for Lawler. He was the one I liked. He was the one that entertained yeah. me. And then eventually Ric Flair entertained me. And then eventually Rick became more neutral than a heel because he had the worldwide appeal and then people started to root for him regardless of what he was. I was gonna say it was too over to really And move. then of course Steve Austin, they could not make a heel. They the crowd didn't want him as a heel. And uh and I'm sure I'm sure WCW had probably a few like that as well, I guess. 
because you have a mind for booking and you've been involved in that aspect, how if you had the authority, if they, you know, they gave the reins to you, is there anything that you think that could be changed to bring it back or to save the ship, or do you think that this is just the business we're in now? Uh, no, you got to change everything. You yeah, change everything. You get, you got you got you got you got you got you got to change the uh, you got to change the culture of what people are watching these days, like like the type of wrestling of this, the type of stuff that the, the future professional wrestlers in this business are interested in. I grew up. I'm, I'm lucky. I'm, I'm like you guys. I grew up watching Flair, Macho, Piper, uh, Hogan. Um, I, I grew up watching these guys do weekly TV. Mm-hmm. I grew up watching all the great, you know, the, the, all the great promos. I, I, I grew up watching all the great work. All the guys that knew how to sell. All the guys that knew how to tell stories. During, I grew up watching all that. Today, people grow up and they're they're um, because of YouTube. You know, they're they're watching J- Japanese wrestling. Yeah, they're they're watching high flyers. They're watching acrobatics. They're watching. They're, they're, they they didn't, the 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 future stars of wrestling today did not get to did not get educated by what we were educated by. The greatest wrestlers in the business performing weekly on TV. What they're getting now is is just these guys that just you know like like what you see the high just just you know the spot monkeys. Yeah, you know. So that's the way that's the way people work. Unfortunately. You can't find me any type of metric or statistic or, or number to put next to the fact that like that style of work d- draws an audience. As a matter of fact, the numbers show it does not draw an audience. It, it, it just you know it, it turns the audience off if you go over the course of time over the past like ten to twelve years as the work has changed and like you know it's it's more acrobatic, more high risk and stuff and there. and the audience has changed. The audience has changed to a bunch of people that basically um, it's like they say it's the same people. It's yeah. a niche group of fans that come to the show that do ch- chants and claps and stuff and everything. You know, all these all these goofy chants that don't really participate the way the wrestling fans so we agree on that. You. you know, so it's like so the, the, the whole culture has changed. You know, well, so it's like uh, exactly. and, 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 and you're not going to get you're not going to get somebody like me to engage back into this if this is the, the way it's going to go. Or you know, to, to, to watch the show to watch the show. I mean, I don't care. You know, I think, I think a lot of people feel the same I, way. I think- W crowd laid the groundwork for the chance and 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 I'm not now I watched Heyman at OVW Heyman Heyman groomed the crowd for that yeah he would I set, watched him do it at OVW and, and he would we, set up plants he'd send out the uh, the trainee kids to sit in the crowd and direct them how to chant and stuff it was really bizarre to watch Glenn this is the world's famous two cow he's the world's most famous dog he appears on most every show he never comes up here unless I'm doing a show that was my doodle sneezing in the back. And uh, has anybody seen Maya Doodle? I think they have. Uh, she was one of the things that you brought up was people watching Japanese wrestling. And I uh, a while back I found some footage of you. You had gone over to do a show for Ultimo Dragon uh, in Torimon. Mm-hmm, yeah, mm-hmm. And you were teaming up with Torimon, uh, Yes, yeah, with Latin Lover and Magnum Tokyo. And to watch yep. you on the apron and to interact with these guys, it was one of the most surreal. <laughs> Because you know it was uh you were teamed with Magnum, who's one of my personal like I mark out huge for Magnum in the entrance, the dancing. Here, here, here's a funny, funny thing about that too. My Twitter profile picture is me backstage at that show. Really? That that that's me with Mas- Masquerita Sagrada. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. At that show, at Tori, at Tori, you want hundred yeah, percent. Yeah. That to me, when I look at that, because I think about the high flying and the characterization of guys. To me, that was the last promotion that really figured out how to do both because the guys there, they all had these over-the-top wacky gimmicks. In the match you were in, I think you guys were wrestling the Italians, which was just bizarre. And it was uh, it was interesting to see because the guys actually lived into the characters and they did all the high-flying crazy spots because that was Ultimo. But it was just interesting to see you trying to interact as this American old style of wrestler. I kind of put you and Jeff Jarrett in a similar vein where you guys work very safe, you guys work very... Uh, not intelligently. Really, yeah, intelligently. I call, yeah. I, call, I call work intelligently. And you get heat for working intelligently this day, these days. You do. And I was trying to explain. You know? to, I was trying to explain to a guy the other night. We had dinner with a guy who wanted some advice about how to book an indie here, and he was saying, "You know, I'm a technique guy. I'm a technique guy. I want guys to do this." I said, "That's you know, first of all, when you look at how a match is, think about a finish. Think about you know, like the Jim Cornette uh, in the Midnight's versus the." Legion of Doom in the scaffold match. What do you remember about that match? He goes, well, Jimmy falling. I said, okay, so that's one thing out of this super dangerous. A lot of us remember that part. Yeah, out of the super dangerous match you remember, that's the one thing. I said, who went over? He goes, I, I don't know. I said, exactly. You don't even remember the finish of it. You just remember Jimmy falling. I said, so you're having all these things happen that aren't being committed to memory. You go home with one thing. Why are you doing all these other things? What is the benefit of that? 
in the moment you might get a cheer, but it's not going home with them. That There's no point to that. So you're wasting all this time and all this effort in all these bumps that are going to wear out your talent. Yeah, Chris, not to be rude, but uh, Two Cow's been up here a long time. Yeah, He's got yeah. his own microphone. <laughs> hey, He's ready to... For, just, let, me, you know. let, 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 let me let me tell you this is, I, I've repeated this. I don't know if you've ever heard me say this, but this is uh, and this is what, what I tell wrestlers today and, and up-and-coming ones, and it's, it's 100% true, and it's very difficult to... Uh, um, it's very difficult to argue with this, okay? okay? Is that if you want to be a professional wrestler, okay, if you want to get over, if you want to be timeless, if you want to, like, if you want people to remember you, you have to have something you, that you do during the match, whether it's a catchphrase or uh, or mannerisms or something that, that people, that fans can imitate, yeah. okay? Because when two 12-year-old kids are going to fight in the lawn with each other, okay, and they're, they're going to have a backyard wrestling match, and one kid's going to be Macho Man Savage, and the other kid's going to be the Disco Inferno. We would have specific things that we would do. That if I, if those kids didn't tell everybody who they were, everybody watching would say, "Hey, that 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 kid's being that kid's being the Macho Man. That kid's being the Disco Inferno." Yeah. Okay. Professional wrestlers today, ninety percent of them, when you ask, "Okay, how do you know which one's which?" You you can't. You you don't you don't. They don't yeah. do anything except moves. You know, and stuff and everything, and that and like they, they don't do the showmanship. Have you noticed that? That especially with with, uh, with raw shows and and I don't really watch much ROH or, or any of the others, but have you noticed that, that that none of the wrestlers are ever scared of anybody anymore? And I saw enough of your stuff that you knew that when you were a heel to be scared of the babyface might be a good idea. Why should they? When the fans don't even cheer, well, they'll, they'll cheer them anywhere, and they'll boo the the baby. It's like brother, the fans j j don't carry. Like like you can be a, a classic heel period of time mm -hmm. okay but then what will happen is these fans because they, they want to be so smart they'll start cheering the heel because they're impressed with his performance and they'll mm -hmm. cheer him they during the and they don't realize that they'll cheer for him during the show which which kills his heat yeah. so like you know, like like wrestling fans literally today don't even realize that they kill the heat of like a lot of their favorite wrestlers and and then they, they don't even really you know like like if a guy is out there like like the funniest thing is um when 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 Samoa Joe debuted, in in uh, in, um, in Raw on Raw, mm -hmm. what did he do? He he hit the, he hit the ring, and he beat, beat he's beating the piss out of out of Seth Rollins, who's a baby face or anything. And then like the fans were chanting like yo know, like like welcome back, welcome, yeah. you know, like thank you, you know, the stuff. I mean, so so the, so you can't. So the funniest thing is like you can try to be a heel. How did they welcome him back to a place he'd never been? Yeah, yeah, I, I don't. But it was like, uh, you deserve it or something. These, these stupid chances just have no place for like during the show. You know what I'm saying? So, yeah. so wrestlers don't really know how to like how to get heat, how to, how to make people boo, how to cheat, how to like you know how to how to how to you know use a dirty tactic to take advantage of it because there they don't are, care. There you know? are experienced wrestlers now, disco that think that's how they're getting over is when they hear the you deserve it's and welcome back and Bro, uh and nobody's over they, they all you gotta do the only way you judge a how 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 over wrestling wrestlers are is just look at the nielsen rating mm, that will help look at the amount of people in the crowd the the the, the rating is the only critic that matters Why it doesn't you? matter if you wrote online you had a great match four star match everything if 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 the ratings stink that means people are not watching you right i don't okay? know and if people aren't watching you you know and somebody else is telling you that you're really good but nobody's watching you it's like okay, you know, maybe the person is telling you that you're really good at what you're doing, yeah. is giving you some bad information because maybe you're not really good at what you're doing, and that's why a lot of people don't bother tuning in the next week to watch you. Well, you know what I'm saying? It's like I, I don't know if you know this or not, but Vince and I uh, had dinner this week. We're just revealing this on the show now, so Vince can safely be out of town and not have mm -hmm. to worry about the, a jealous friend here of where we ate at and the things that we did. But we were talking, uh, Krista. Do you recall the entire conversation? How we were talking? Which, which part we talked about? Um, oh, good lord! I'm, I'm losing my train of thought now. But we were talking about um, how you realize you're you're over or not, and then like he's saying about the the ratings point. But there was one other point that we were driving home that Vince and I were talking about, and now now I've kind of totally forgot <laughs> when it comes, where I was going with when it. it comes you, back, jump in. All um, right, I'll, I'll jump back in in a minute. But I've lost where I was going. To that point, like with what you're saying, I feel like the uh, you were talking about the portrayal of guys and their characters, and there's no difference. If you look at Seth Rollins to Dean Ambrose, if you were to you know put them both under a mask, it's the same guy. They don't do anything different. The 
the upper card to the lower card, there isn't a distinct characterization between any of those guys beyond, I guess, maybe the New Day, because they do the weird dancing and the unicorn stuff. The Who Day and the Who Those. Yeah, but there's not really anybody. Uh, Shinsuke does his mannerisms, but it's so narrow and so just trying to be badass Japanese style wrestlers. And they're completely missing the point of what it is. And you were talking about how the ratings have gone down so significantly and that it's fallen into this niche business. There isn't enough of a market out there for guys to appeal to people to bring that in. It's, you know, you went from to where Nitro was drawing a six, Raw was drawing a three or a four, and vice versa for years, to where now Raw is lucky to draw a two or a three. And I think it's well, been Well, they, they that. said that Cornette's show with uh, TNA or whatever they call themselves now was the lowest rated show they'd ever done at barely even 200,000 viewers. And I remember even when Hogan was there, I know he promised 3 million viewers, and they got, I think, maybe 1.3, 1.6 at max. Hey, good for Hulk. Uh, if he could but bring that be, many but people it, in. But it beats the hell out of under 200,000. It, it, it certainly does. But This is what I don't get. And, Glenn, I know you and me have talked about this on Who's this? Vince. Hey, but uh, the, today's – it's like you got The Rock – Last year was the biggest movie star in the world box office, okay? John Cena hosted the ESPYs, but today's wrestlers don't want to be those guys. They want to be the guy that gets a five-star from Dave Meltzer, <laughs> you know, that gets the tweets from the diehards saying, great match, what a spot. And and the the um, the money difference, like, between The Rock and John Cena and, like, Will Ospreay, you know what I mean? And, and, and the, it, I just don't understand that logic with a lot of today. Oh, here, here's the problem, and this is, this is the main problem: is that the boys would rather wrestle. The, 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 and this is true too. Okay, and it, the, you, it's very hard, 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 hard argue, very difficult to argue this, bro. The boys will literally work for less at those PWG shows because Dave Meltzer comes to the shows. <laughs> okay. Okay. That that that's a shoot. Yeah. All right, like people say, oh, they get you know, like the bro, the, the PWG guys get get paid less money because Dave Meltzer and those guys they, they they put over the shows, and they they literally think that going on then doing those shows, okay, and having a wrestling writer rate your match and give it a good rating will improve your marketability for work on the on the indie scene, and that's bro, that, that that's a that, that's a shoot thing that is happening today. Yeah. Okay. Like, like these guys will, will literally wrestle for less if they think that they can go. You know, I have a if the, if the guy that writes the Wrestling Observer thinks that they have a good enough match and will give it a high rating, that they think that increases their marketability to, to independent promoters. And the funniest thing about it is, it just shows you how we're, we're ba basically it's just a bunch of marks, marks. The boys are marks. And you know, and that, and that's that's the industry that we're in right now. You're running by a bunch of people that don't look at this as a business. They yeah. just look at it as like they'd, they'd rather go wrestle a show and get a good rating from Dave Meltzer than make more money. Disco, you we, know, and that, that's that, that's true. You know, no, I, I can't argue that. Yeah. Uh, but Disco, we all started out as a mark at one level or another, or elsewise, we wouldn't even mm -hmm. be here today. Uh, I've expressed that Jerry Lawler was the only reason I ever got into wrestling business. What led you to the wrestling business? Who was it that said, Hey, I want to do this. I, I want to be like him. Um, something, something got you here. Well, so, well okay, yeah. So, so basically what uh, a friend of the family, my old soccer coach, I've known for like 20 something years, okay. uh, is, um, uh, he used to do the book to travel for the NBA. He used to work with Ole Anderson. When it was when it was Georgia Championship Wrestling, he was a travel agent, no and he but he booked all the guys travel, so he knew Oli and Seven and all that. And uh, mm -hmm. when I finished college, the week I got out of college, he was like, "Do you want to do you want to trial for professional wrestling?" I was like, "Sure," and I never looked back. I went to, there was a school in Atlanta um, that that Bill Eady was running, right. and Steve Brawler Lawler was a trainer. I went and tried out. Uh, they took they gave the money for the trial. They they okay, you could go to school. I, I went to the school. I trained for five months, and I was a professional wrestler. Where'd you go to college? Georgia, Georgia. Oh, you Georgia boy, huh? Yeah. Mm -hmm. oh, bulldog. Uh, did you? you know, do... I grew up in Atlanta. I've, I've been in Atlanta 30, you know, thirty-eight years. I was in Atlanta. Wow. Did you do any uh, uh, amateur wrestling in high school or uh, at the university? No. Just played sports, but didn't play. Uh, played soccer, mm -hmm. organized. Uh, but I didn't play. I didn't play football and baseball. So okay. So you got the. Card. I played a pickup, you know, but I didn't play. Like I played. I quit organized soccer. Organized football, like in tenth grade. 
Yeah. I, I'd quit, but then, uh, but after, but I always play. I played sports, you know, intramural, like all the intramural scene and stuff and all that. I did. You but know. believe it or not, even in my size, I, I was a, a great, uh, huge fan of playing baseball, basketball, football, and did up until what Chris, my forties, I guess, until yeah, and the weight really got uh, down. Weight, weight got way out of control. Had a congestive heart failure, gained a lot of fluid weight, and went from two seventy five at age forty two to where I weighed five sixty nine at age fifty two. And uh, fortunately now, uh, I mean, this still sounds horrible. I'm, I'm down to in the 420s now, but uh, 569, when you wake up one day and realize you're closer to 600 than you are 500, and only 10 years ago, 12 years ago, you were about 275, uh, boy, that's scary. That's scary. Because uh, I remember what happened to Yoko, and uh, he was around the 600 mark. I hear he got up to maybe close to 750 or 800, but there's no confirmation of that, I don't think. One of Jimmy's lines about Yoko was they sent him to the fat farm and he ate the place. Yeah, he gained weight. He went to the yeah. Duke. He went to the Duke Weight Loss Center and he gained weight at Duke. Yeah, I don't know how you do that. Um, <laughs> Jesus, yeah. what they said. One of those uh, funny lines from Cornette. Uh, it's odd to find ourselves. Yeah, in the place. He had a couple. Yeah, it's it's odd to find ourselves in the place we're in with Jimmy because it's like he wants to murder us. Like no exaggeration. Mm -hmm. Like he, especially me, he wants to kill me. Yeah, but he, I have all these funny fond memories of the guy. Oh, um, well. what do you yeah, do? Uh, wait till they see the autograph Vince sign for me. They'll all love that. Oh God, that's gonna um, be ugly. But yeah, it's gonna get ugly. When you were first getting in, what was your opinion of being around on the indie scene, trying to kind of progress through it? Because you said you did five weeks in Memphis. Did you go straight from Memphis to WCW, or yeah. I went from Memphis to quit? I quit doing the Disco Inferno character because I really wasn't because I was real green and I, I'd quit do doing it back then. Okay. Um. So obviously you came up, and then I just. Uh, yeah, and I just I just did like other goofy gimmicks and everything, but then I, I still had that character in my bag, and um mm. there was a there was a wrestling show over in Mississippi where they were starting TV and and a page hooked me up with Jake the Snake and mm -hmm. Jake brought me over there to work for these guys and I got over pretty good doing the disco character the first TV tapings. Then Terry Taylor was the booker there mm -hmm. and he was also working at WCW at the time, so he started bringing me back over you know and so he liked them. and they've been basically between between Terry Taylor and Page. They ended up giving me a tryout at WCW. Wow! And I went to WCW and got my tryout of because I was doing that character, and um and it got the character got over the first night. That's impressive. So I got hired on the spot. Like I was getting a good crowd reaction, like the disco sucks chance and stuff, and everything, all that. You know, the first time I I, I got good. I, I mean, no lie. I literally like one of, one of, they, they like, one of the top three the heel reactions on, on the entire show, and it was my tryout. Deserve it or welcome back or any of that. Um, <laughs> That's crazy, right? One, one, one quick question. This is going to be the stupidest question you've ever been asked in your life. Did you ever eat at the Big Chicken? Oh, of course. Oh, there you go. There right you down go. the field. Five minutes, five minutes where I grew up, yeah. Is it still there? Oh, uh, yeah, it's still there. Thank God. Thank God. Absolutely. They, they can't take that down. Where is the Big Chicken? I don't know what this oh, is. Oh, you've eaten there a hundred times. You I, just don't remember. I don't when, know. When yeah. you was a baby, we used to go. It's Kentucky Fried Chicken. Oh, okay. And it's the South Man Parkway and the and the uh, and the um and Roswell Road. You can see the chicken from the from the uh, from space. I mean, it's just it's a, it's a large chicken. It yeah. is a great big. God, what would you say? Two or three stories tall, I guess. The chicken, he big, big chicken, Listen. and it's known as the big chicken. It's the landmark in in northern Georgia, to where if you don't know where you're at, well, hey, from the big chicken, how do you get there? And that's how everybody knows how to get anywhere, uh, and around Roswell and. Life, Marietta around there. Is, life how, do you, GPS. How, how do you get there from the big chicken? Well, there was no GPS. When why we were I said there. life before GPS. Okay, Glenn. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, I told you the stupidest question he's ever asked. Have you ever, he's looked at me like I lost my mind. Well, of course chicken. I've eaten at the big chicken. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And um, you have too. You just don't remember. Talk uh, to your mother about I'll, it. I'll, I'll ask her. Yeah. I think, her I think we got divorced at the big chicken. <laughs> 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 okay. I wanted more chicken and she didn't. <laughs> well, screw you. When you're from Kentucky, get out of my house, Biatch. Uh, you can say Biatch on here, I think. Yeah, we're trying yeah, to I get think that one flies. Uh, <laughs> podcast one in the realm with the IPG yeah, 13. Bo and Alley Live is no disqualification, uh, no time limit. No matter. You, know, you just can't get kicked off Bo and Alley Live. Uh, Glenn, yeah. when you were in WCW, <laughs> you guys were kind of uh, the beginning of that change from the characters towards the workers. You guys had the guys like Malenko, Benoit, who, even though they were great characters, it was more focused on the technical side of doing the moves, of getting the reactions. 
more of the Melter style wrestling that we progressed to now. Uh, the AAA guys came in, the Japanese guys came in. What was the opinion of guys in the locker room, the guys like you, the guys who have been around longer, who had that more old school mentality, the Nashes, people like that watching these guys? Was there the feeling of uh, this will eventually kill the business? Was it more they were just doing their own thing? Or how was that looked at back then? Yeah, well, we were impressed with the work, you know. It's an impressive, it's an impressive style of work. But the thing is, though, is you can understand, is like, bro, you watch, you watch Eddie, Benoit, Jericho, so watch them work still compared to the way these guys work today. Yeah, it's still, it's it's maybe the same style, but it's still different. There's still some showmanship in in between the spots, and there's still a level of um, like like the the, the psychology's gone so far off the map, uh, like these days. Like you know, ba- basically when when those guys would work. And you watch the matches. You know, they do like a lot more stuff, but you never really watch the matches thinking like, wow, that didn't make a lot of sense. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like you watch matches today and nobody really puts their matches together adhering to to like a a, a lot of um like common sense principles. Like yeah. basically what do I've always had like I was t- talking with somebody the other day, they go, what's ring psychology? I said, well, I go the way I look at it. Well, I, there's really no no answer because it's never been a book written on professional wrestling. But to me, ring psychology is if you're if you're laying on a match, you're asking yourself constantly over and over, why would I do this? Why would you do this if I did this? Why would I? You 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 constantly ask the question, why would I do this? Okay, and you lay on a match, the the path has to follow the logical answer to that question. Yeah. Why would I do this if you did that? And why would I? You know, and it has to the the, the match has to make sense. I'm dying. Well, it's gotten, yeah. This goes it's it's gotten it's gotten so far off. Like you said, now we kick out of all these finishers. Like you know, when it's just it, but wrestling's it's the ring psychology has been replaced by by like kind of like math equations. Yeah, you know, oh. like you, you, they lay the match like a math equation. You do this, you know, back to me. I do this back to you. You do this back to me. Uh, kick out. You do this kick out. You do this kick out. I, I do this reverse kick out. So, you know, instead of like if I if I hit you with all, all those moves, what would you do? You know, mm. it's like you'd be, you'd be dead. I'm you know, not, it's not. like that, that 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 question isn't asked anymore. Or, you know, it's like that. So, but but when you go watch and watch Eddie and go watch Eddie and Ben. Go, go on, just just randomly search. Watch Eddie and Benoit when they wrestle each other. Yeah, they're Run smaller down. guys, but it was far more physical. Okay, even when they did the dives outside the ring, they looked like they were they were hurting each other when they were doing them. You know, something today it's like. You watch guys. It's like it's literally like like it is like like when you're back in the back in the in the in the, in the locker rooms at the shows, where the guys are going through their spots and they're dancing around like ballroom dancers. Yeah, you know, okay, like okay, and you're 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 in the locker room and it looks like a ballroom dance room, you know, like where the, yeah. the guys are going over their matches and everything. That's what the matches look like today. Yeah, two. You know, just like it looks like ballroom dancers. They're dancing with you. Everybody's cooperating with each other, working. You do this and stuff, and and that's the way it looks. It didn't really look like it back then. That's how wrestling's evolved. Is 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 you don't hide the cooperation between the two guys like we used to, you know. Two of the things I gotta ask you, and this is just cracking Jeff Lane up over here, is you've been the only one able to shut me up in three weeks over here. That's true, <laughs> and I'm sure the fans are thanking him for it. Um, you were talking about why would I do this? Well, if he did this, why would I do this? Answer me this: I have never understood the rationale of the backdrop. And I'm sure that back I mean, in the day, you had to take his minute. He 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 hates the move, the backdrop. He it. doesn't understand. I despise it. He doesn't I despise understand it. why anybody does them. Why, why anybody takes them? He, oh, this, the ones that take them really irk me. I know why you give them, uh, but I, the guy that takes them, I'll I'll, I'll, t- I'll tell you what the, the 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 logic is in the backdrop. Please help me. If you if you throw a guy into the ropes, uh-huh. and he's and he's running at you, stupid enough to come okay, back. You you you're either going to stand there. And let him knock you down, uh-huh. or you're going to reach. You're going to bend over and uh-huh. flip the guy over you. I you know, to say that now. Let me go here with you. If you throw me into the ropes and I hit the ropes, and I said, "Well, I guess there's only one thing to do: go back to the guy that threw me into these ropes." Why wouldn't I? And I've done this before, just to screw with people. Grab the ropes and get on out of the ring, and leave the guy in there to figure out what he's going to do next. Because it's- that's, a good, that's a good question, but there's an art. It's because because a lot of guys don't don't hit the ropes correctly. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Like, if you hit the road, if you like, and and the thing when I tell people, like, when when I when I teach, I, I teach, I, I teach still. Uh-huh. It's yeah. like when I teach you to hit the ropes, you have to hit the ropes. You got to hit them correctly. You know, okay. Because if you if, if you slow that. down, you didn't learn if much. You slow down. If you actually hit the, if somebody throws you in the ropes and uh-huh. you hit the ropes, uh-huh. okay, for a shoot, 
you hit the ropes and you hit it hard enough to where in, in that split second it bounces you back into the you know like like it's like a like a, a slingshot type situation. Yeah. If you if somebody throws you into the ropes mm -hmm. and you stop, turn around, pivot, and like hit and slow down when you hit the ropes. Yeah, it doesn't make a lot of sense for somebody to do it like that. Or wh yeah, why would you just not grab the ropes? So when I teach people when I do the spot when I teach people to hit the ropes. I teach him to throw the guy into the ropes and mm -hmm. throw him in close enough to yeah. where it looks like you're throwing him hard enough to where he couldn't that, reach and get catch himself in time. That you makes know sense. sense. I'll grant you that. If you're close enough to where he is going to come back at least a little. But when they're standing three quarters across from the ring, and then they throw him in, and then obviously they take the right. candy ass approach because they're scared they're going to get hurt or fall out. But when they do that candy ass thing, and then they come all uh -huh. the way back to take that backdrop, and then of course if you ain't taking it in the center of the ring. It's going to hurt right. a little bit more anyway, so uh, so that was just part of it. And uh, watch, I just, well, bro, watch guys like the rest in the seventies and stuff the way they did it. Uh -huh. Oh, Lawler, that, that's how that's how they do it. That's how they that's how they do it. And you know, and you make it look like like even shooting in the ropes is like actually a shoot. You know, now they, they don't they don't they don't you know, it's, a, it's gotten to the point where they, they, don't, they don't do it correctly anymore. Correct. Yeah, well, uh, that might be why you don't see him because no one does it correctly. But uh, the flair, if you'll remember, uh, always landed on his side. I heard it was because of uh, from the plane crash that uh, he just learned to take him on the side, and, and he felt more comfortable doing it that way. Was was that the reason you guys were given? Because he's the only one I ever saw take him that way. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, it, he probably takes that way because he's just used to landing that way. He probably his back hurt from the from the. Right. Plane crash, you know. Okay. He just started like taking them. You know, I mean, I've seen him take them within the last few years, and he still takes them exactly the same way as he did back in the seventies yeah. and eighties. What led change? What led to you leaving TNA when you left? Because you left in the early two thousands, I believe, and you were kind of a pillar of that place in the early days. Oh, did the, 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 they change bookers on the book, and then Dusty, uh, D Dusty, let me go. Okay. I'd always wondered that. Yeah. When I first started watching it, I uh, the thing that kind of brought me back into wrestling was actually you and Vince doing the Sports Entertainment Extreme thing. I was about 15, and that registered with me really well. That you, you got to tell him the shirt you had Vince. Yeah, I actually had Vince sign my Sports Entertainment Extreme shirt. Um, and he says he doesn't even do have one. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I've had mine for, I guess, 15, 16 From years the looks now. of it, a long time. Yeah, it's, it's an old shirt. <laughs> but... Uh, that was what brought me back in. So I remember seeing it. And I remember you were elevated all the way up in that thing. You had a good match with AJ and Raven and all that. And then I watch on FS1 and you're gone pretty shortly after you guys went to that, I think, at least uh, you know, about a year in. And I was like, well, that's an odd booking choice to me. You and Siaki were two of the guys that I would have probably kept around. But um, So I'd always wondered kind of what led to you departing when you did. Um, yeah, like just money issues, I think. Okay. I was always it depends on who was booking, you know. Yeah. yeah, and um, and plus I was a uh, like the later part, like you know, I, I I was not a full time wrestler back then either. Yeah, you know, like I said, especially in two thousand eight, I kind of just I started working for a living. You know what I'm saying? So uh, yeah. it was um, yeah. So it was like um, I just just been in now. You know, they change they, they change bookers a lot. Some of the guys want to use me. Some of the guys, you know, when Vince is booking, they use me. Yeah, mm -hmm. you know, but when Dusty booked, just like you know, they they didn't. Uh. So, you know, it was just, you know, like the, the, the 2003 asylum, that, that was, that was the favorite, that, that was the best time. Yeah. You know, cause I was, uh, yeah. Cause that's like me and like, cause, cause we would book, like we not wrote the show, but like we, we would come up with a lot of the angles just in the car. It'd be me, Perry Sanders, Raven and, and Russo. And you know, the, the drive from Atlanta to Nashville, we, we would come up with like a lot of the ideas we, we, we had in that show. Yeah. You Those know? Are so, um, Go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, to me, those like were some of the most organic shows. Like it was, they always talk about Russo and Crash TV that gets thrown out a lot, but it was the most to me that was the highest evolution of that sports entertainment style because everything mm -hmm. was fairly unpredictable. Characters were consistent. The matches were good because you had guys like AJ D'Lo, guys who could you know work that style if they needed to. But everything going on around that supported it and made it coherent to people like me who wanted to see angles, who wanted to see promos. We wanted to see guys elevate. There were story arcs. And to me, if like I went back and I watched that series last year, it's all on YouTube or it was then. It all holds up. The booking of it's great. The characters are great. It's a lot the of work. Fun. Yeah, the work. The great. work. Yeah. The, the, you know, the, these, bro, these, these are like the young, like uh, the uh, you had young Chris Sabins. 
Yeah. You know, young Alex Shelley, young Chris Daniels, young Frankie, you know, when, when they were young. Oh, yeah, gross. And when they were experimenting, oh. they were like the, when they were innovating and stuff and all that, you know. Yeah. So you had that. Then you had like a lot of the old school guys in the show. We'd have a surprise every week and stuff. You know, you'd have like a, it was a good mix. And brother, the one thing that was great about that show is is across the board, the mic work was fantastic. Yeah. From for you know like every character on the show, nobody cut a bad promo. No, nobody. You know what I'm saying? There wasn't there wasn't a bad, poorly scripted promo where a guy was struggling, and everything, and all that. You know, and that's the thing that people sit there and say the, the funniest thing is like the, those shows. Like if you want to like if you want to rip Vince Russo, all I gotta say is like bro, bro, just go back and watch those shows. Yeah. Because Vince was producing those those interviews with those with guys, and like you know it was just he give them an idea. This is what we want. You know, let them let them take his idea and do what they want. You know, stuff and But um, but you saw like a. Uh, we we tried to make it look unscripted. Yeah, it was like scripted, unscripted television. You know, bro. The, no lie. During those shows, we do those shows for a shoot. We would just like go if if Vince saw a spot for a run in, he would say, "Hey, let's just go. Let's just go out there." Okay. You know, <laughs> and and we would just do we we do a run in. You know, yeah. <laughs> stuff like you know, like, the guys kind of figured all oh, those. You know, the, we tell them afterwards, yeah, that was a good good spot for a run in right there. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It you know, if we do it, it's a big, big deal, right? You know, so it's like something you'd never see today, you know. But uh, mm-hmm. but yeah, no. those those are great shows. I, I love yeah, I love those stuff. They were a whole lot of fun to watch. Chris it's, turned me on to Christopher Daniels. I didn't know much about him until Chris was talking about him in TNA. And I tell you what, he he was somebody that really thoroughly impressed me. And uh, on top of that, what was the mask character he did? Curry Man. I loved Curry Man. Yeah, Curry, Curry Man was a lot of fun. Man. Never, of course, every mask man fooled me ever and i never knew it was him until you told me yeah i watched him and some old japanese stuff and man just entertaining i love curry man i think curry man's probably better than daniels as far as the character goes <laughs> i actually but, thought so too to be um, honest with you but yeah that to me that was uh because i was always brought up in you know jimmy's little vacuum of wrestling obw was you know life basically and i'd always heard that russo was this terrible guy this terrible writer I'd heard, you know, negative stuff about you. So then I get in there and I'm watching it and it's like, man, these guys can go. These guys can talk. These guys are good characters. This, you know, it's interesting. The first time I saw AJ Styles, the first time I saw Paul London, a lot of those guys who went on to kind of be somebody outside of that TNA world and the guys who built TNA. And I think a lot of the fans don't have any knowledge of that era that the asylum, I think, has been largely forgotten, unfortunately. And that whole thing that you guys did and put together was just amazing. And I wish that more people saw it. I really do. Yeah, that was the thing. A lot of people didn't see it because it was you had to pay ten bucks a week. Yeah, to see that show, and not many did it. Yeah, you're you're right. I forgot all about that. I think I was fifty. Jeff, did you, got- did you watch those shows, Jeff? Yeah, because Rudy was working for them, so he would he would bring home copies where I could watch them for free. Oh really? Yeah. Not, Wait, so you God knew Rudy? You spend any money? Yeah. Wait, how yeah, did I you know to- Rudy? I when I got into wrestling, that's where I met him. We used to be roommates and stuff. Like we shared a department together. No idea. Oh, is that why yeah. Vince rips, rips on him all the time? Yeah, yeah. So that's I. That's how oh. I got a uh, uh, connection with Vince was through Rudy. I've known Rudy for years. Wow, interesting. Yeah, yeah. I know that. Uh, there's a there's actually a fan on Twitter who I'll shout him out on here. His name is Rahul. Uh, Rahul Mankar, I think he's a uh, good guy. Yeah, any guy lives yeah. in Colorado, I think, yeah. and he's a diehard fan of those early TNA shows. So I'm gonna go ahead and put him over since we're on here. Um, but yeah, I wish that more people would kind of see that and kind of get an appreciation for that because to me, that's kind of that hyper realism is kind of where I feel like wrestling should have gone and it didn't. And I think that that's uh, instead we went to the family friendly. These guys struggling to do promos. I saw Roman Reigns do the Shield reunion the other day, mm. and I've never seen a guy making that much money struggle so hard well, to say a basic you, sentence. You saw the one he did with Cena, where Cena basically cut his balls off. Yeah, which poor guy. I mean, yeah. how he came back from that, I don't know. What's but... your opinion on that, Glenn? Surely you either heard about it, saw it, or heard a little bit about it. What did you think about Cena uh, basically cutting Reigns' balls off in the middle of the ring during a promo? The first public neuter. I thought it was entertaining. Of... I thought it was entertaining. Oh, it was that, entertaining. That's, that's, no that's, I would do that. I would. I would. I would. I would have done that. You would have done it. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's, it's a funny it. spot. Like, you guys, you know, that that. But that's the way they try to. They're trying to sell the angle. If I'd have done that, no. You're kind of like a shoot. They're trying to sell it as a shoot. So I got shoot on him and they're out there. You know, so I don't. If I'd have done that, no. Nobody, Danny would have. Danny and Jimmy would have fired me on the spot. I guarantee you. Really? Oh yeah. How come? Uh, well, because now you have buried our one of our stars. Now no one's going to put any stock into him. You've embarrassed him. You've humiliated him. You've made a fool out of him. Now the fans are going to laugh at him instead of be behind him. Oh, that's what they would tell. <laughs> Yo, you're you're right. It was very entertaining. I'm sitting there going, you know, because it was like real television. 
holy crap. You all say crap because you all like that. <laughs> Don't get beefed, yeah. Yeah, I worked on a Christian broadcast network. For crying out it loud. doesn't show. It does not show. <laughs> but, uh, no, I was thoroughly entertained by it. And I'm going, I'm feeling bad for Roman Reigns. I'm going, my God, I hope you learn how to cut a promo by next week. Because, <laughs> she man. <laughs> This one of, was brutal. One but of the no, things, they would have fired me for that. I promise you. They would have fired me on the spot. And one of the things I'll say to expand on what he's saying about Cornette. They may have cut my mic. One of the things I'll say about working for Jimmy and OVW, he never did it to me because I think he knew that he couldn't get by with it. But Jimmy, if you went slightly off script, <laughs> if you like messed up a finish of a match, it, everything on TV had to be exactly as it appeared in Jimmy's head. Well, you know that didn't work with me. Either. No, and it never worked <laughs> with most people because most people, you can't see what Jimmy's thinking. But to yeah. work for Cornette in that environment, if you went slightly beyond or slightly below, or if somebody messed up something, even if they recovered perfectly, even if the fans were, you know, salivating. Clueless. Yeah. For what's going to happen next week, Jimmy would lose his mind and you would get like one of these promos like he cuts on Vince on his show. It Everything had to be so detailed down to the letter of what he thought that if not, he would just go ape shit. I was one of the few that had free reign. And then even every now and then they throw a pen at me in the ring or whatever, because I wasn't talking about, what he wanted me to talk about. And all of a sudden his ink pen would fly through the ring. And I was like, Oh, I guess I'm not talking about what he wants me to talk about. Uh, but I just, I just never was a script guy. It just did not come off right. And I wasn't cornet, you know, uh, and I'd hear the boys doing these cornet style promos yeah. because they're reading word for word, what he wrote down for them. I, was gonna and I just thought that was, I just thought it was a terrible way to teach people how to do promos. Yeah. Everything cornet wants everybody to be cornet. I think like, Everybody thinks that Cornette's this great promo guy. That he, but he'll he'll never say that. No, no, he'll never admit this. But everybody thinks that Cornette's this great promo guy. I've been around him all thirty of my years, I, and I've been yelled at all his life. <laughs> yeah, all he's my been life. Around yeah. all his life. Yeah, all my life I've been around Jimmy. Um, and everything that he says is something that's pre-rehearsed. If you ever get into a promo battle with Cornette, if it ever comes up, just hear me out on this. It won't. <laughs> well, if you ever at a convention, he's in Vegas or whatever, whatever. If you ever get into a promo battle with Cornette. If you can get him out of his pre-rehearsed Laurel and Hardy, Dutch Mantel, Jerry Lawler shtick. Abbott and Costello. Abbott and Costello. Dr. He will, Smith. Dr. Smith from Lost in Space. He will be helpless. He will stutter and stammer and look like a fool. Uh, I did it to him on one of the Joe Cronin shows to where I wouldn't let him go into his pre-rehearsed stuff. Had no idea what to do. Jimmy is... It got ugly. Jimmy, I, I think he has autism. I've always thought that for a while. There, come on. Um, no doubt. And uh, if you want him to that either, and if you keep him out of this, his comfort, and that's not good or bad. No, I mean, no, no. Just, I, he just won't admit it. I have Asperger's syndrome. I was diagnosed with it ten years and ago. I'm proud of it. It's you know, it is what it is. But I'm not you, supposed to touch my son. I just I, I hate up. being tapped. Yeah, oh, well. Um, but if you if you keep Jimmy out of that comfort, he's helpless, like a child. And it's funny, but well, you just got more heat. You might as well just go on Reddit with this. Yeah, uh, I got heat over doing an AMA on Reddit about Jimmy. I uh, don't know. A lot of people. Why he wants to kill you now? Yeah, why he wants to kill me now? And he owns a gun. Um, he owns several. Uh, we own two butter knives. Bring it on, asshole! I gotta, I gotta <laughs> bleep that. Um. So yeah, there, there's a little cornet inside information for people that are on here. Just don't let him get do his scripted stuff, and he'll be helpless. Who are you training for down in Vegas, Glenn? Uh, Future Stars of Wrestling. I'm actually in the process that... of training. Seth. I've been training Seth and Bonner lately. Oh, okay. How's he doing? Good. Really good. How's it going? Really good. Uh, Rico lives in Vegas. Rico. I don't see Vegas. him. I, yeah, I don't see him a lot. I, I used to see him a couple years ago. He's come by the club every now and then, but uh, I don't see him. Uh, I didn't know if he was. I know that he was doing some stuff with Future Stars. I think I didn't know if he was around. If you were around when he was around working with them. Um. No, he did. He I, no, not, not when I was there. So. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I was curious about that. He's uh, he's been a good friend of ours for many, many, many years. Is it raining or did Two Cow get a bath? I don't know. Uh, yeah, think, and Rico was on this the last episode of the show. If anybody didn't see it, check that out. Last cast and, holy Jesus, what's going on over there? <laughs> Maya, oh my God. Maya's has anybody little, seen Maya? Maya's breaking things. There she is. Breaking a lot of things. Say hi, to, say hi to the Disco Inferno, Maya. I just got in the cat after you. She's, she's breaking things. <laughs> uh, my merchandise, Disco's heart. Yeah, she's just, uh, Disco's going to be heartbroken here. Um, All right. But no, it's uh, it's one of those things. I feel like uh, a lot of people, and that's part of the reason I was when I started having communication with events. I wanted to kind of get people to see that like this is actually a person. This is kind of taken in a different direction because I think so many of Cornet's fans and so many of these Reddit fans and these internet fans, they look at you know Vince and to a lesser extent you is like 
an extension of what Cornette has said for all these years. And it's this unrealistic, just psychotic version of reality. And I... Well, bro, it's just, it, it, listen, this is what it is. It's, it's Cornette, it's Meltzer, it's Keller, it's, it's, fa it's, it's fake news. Yeah. It's, it's classic. It's a, it's a classic false narrative yeah. that has been spread from people that, that, write for, that write things that people read. Yeah, you know, and that, and that and that's all it is. Like if you, uh, like people that meet Vince the first time, like they, they, they you know, they, they can't believe this is the person that they, they like. Right. This is the guy, you know. So they killed wrestling, bro. It's just it's, it's the most illogical argument you you could make. Yeah, you know, they're like that. Like We're somehow when, when Vince wrote, when Vince wrote for WWE, okay, they did the, they did great numbers. It was the greatest period of time ever. Yeah, he hasn't written there since. Okay. But somehow his body of work after that, you know, in like lower organizations and teenage, has somehow led to the decline of professional wrestling. Yeah, I feel like this is like if a, like if a coach of a team, like if they went to the Super Bowl and the coach quit, and they hired a new coach and the team sucked after that, you'd be blaming on the coach that coached the team when they were during their period of, of uh, when they were successful for the 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 um, the failures that came afterwards when yeah. he wasn't coaching the team. And it's just like, bro, it's like those guys um, have their have their opinion of what they like about wrestling. Vince basically, you know, at the expense of like, you know, uh, they basically having to write things the, the way like the, you don't like him to draw new fans. Uh, he drew the ire of these guys. Yeah. You know, it's something they so, but but you know, but you can't look at the success of like like here's here's what Vince does, and this is what people don't realize. He may do things on the show that you may not like and think it's stupid. Oh, that's dumb. But the whole purpose of the of what he does is to try to get more people to watch the show next week. Yeah. To, to draw from an audience, you have to try to grab an audience. Okay. And the audience of people that aren't watching the show, you have to do that with things that you wouldn't be doing on the show. Yeah. Traditionally. Yeah. That that's just the way it works. That's how that's how you increase an audience. Like if you're just sitting there just just just, just doing a show where you want a good critical review, he'd write he'd write it differently. Yeah, he just put a bunch of guys together that have great matches and have 15, 20 minute match, you know. But but that's not the, but that's not the way Vince writes. Vince is always trying to write a show, trying to get more people to watch. Yeah, and like these guys have tried to make it sound like that that, that they've tried to make it sound like that he's incompetent at writing a show. Yeah, but I'm like, wait a second, if if the, the object if the, if the writer is supposed to get the person to increase the ratings, he's that's what he he's done a better job at it than anybody else has. Yeah, you know, but but they'll say that, that he's incompetent. So that that's I, you know, it's, it, and it's the, the 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 argument is so asinine that if you took it to a court of law, it would like it would just be crushed, you know. If you took a, if you took all the evidence and everything, so and then plus all the people that have worked with Vince know know what he brings to the table, yeah. You know, they, they don't they don't have to defend. I'm one of the only guys that have ever defended him publicly, you know. But like, uh, just because people know that he and our friends, I used to write with him too. I've yeah. I've been in the room with Vince and been written with him before, and I've seen I've seen what other bookers have try to do it like well, what they bring to the table and you know i just i know what he tries to do we have both been uh defending uh vince very publicly for a year and a half two years now i guess in the ballpark yes yeah, and a uh and really when this thing come out to where we thought jimmy was a danger to vince uh we were the ones that encouraged him to file the epo we talked him out of having jimmy arrested for terroristic threatening but we did encourage him to go ahead and file the epo and uh, so that right. got, that got, I'd say, a little heat on me. I didn't lose too many fans over it. But so, well, then here's the funniest thing. I gained a lot. Is that thing that story comes out, and and I'm sitting there arguing on Conan's show with a guy like with a guy like Ryan Satin, who's trying to tell me like it's it's clearly, you know, uh, Jim Cornette has no intention of ever like doing any, anything like this. And I'm like, bro, how do you know? Yeah, it's they like, do. you don't know that. I, I go, you know, they, 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 it's very like the, that. That's Jim's fatal flaw. Uh -huh. It's bro. He lets this stuff bother him too much. Yeah, yes. yeah which I've seen like like that, you know, bro. The guy's one of the most brilliant guys in professional wrestling. One of the greatest performers of all time. But his ha hatred for Vince Russo like overshadows his body of work in the business. It's like that's all the that's all people know him as now. It's his but, entire. But here, here, here's my analyzation of this disco: is that um, it's all he's got right now. He's, right. he's forgiven Vince uh, McMahon. He's forgiven Stephanie. Forgiven Bischoff. Triple H. Bischoff. They they kissed and made up. Right. And, uh, as a matter of fact, um, Jimmy was even begging Bischoff for compliments on the show, which really irritated me. I thought it made Jimmy look weak, uh, right. and a lot of other people did too. 
And the only thing he has right now that his base goes for, and I don't know if you're a Trump guy or not. He is. Okay. Well, he'll understand this then. Trump has a base and he feeds the base red meat. Well, Mm -hmm. Jimmy's base are those that hate Russo and he's got to feed them that red meat. And if he things up with Russo now, he's got nothing. There's nobody else. to. There's nobody else. So he's got. Here's another Here's another thing too. This, this is a theory. You've known him way, way longer than I do. Forty-one the, years. The guy obviously, the guy obviously loves to argue. Correct. Yes. yes. I mean, and I do too. But okay. Too well, well, but here's 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 a theory, bro. Like he's super conservative when it comes to to pro wrestling values. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. He's super liberal when it comes to politics. So you know, and then, and then my question, you know, why? So he can argue literally with everybody. Yeah. <laughs> so like, I, if I have, if I, if I have the conservatives on one side that I can argue with, I have the liberals on the other side that can argue. I can argue with everybody. You know, yeah. so it's like, and that's one of the things Jim well, he loves I'm, to do. I'm, he I'm loves to argue. He does yeah. I'm an independent. Chris is an independent. Now, Jimmy is registered Democrat, correct? He is, yeah, but he was always a Republican up until Obama got in there. And, and I, I and think, he lives the lifestyle of a Republican. I think that him being a liberal is a big work. I've told him that. I've told a lot of We've his fans that. Him that. I think that it's a big work just so he has more people he can fight with. I yeah. don't think he buys into it. Yeah, exactly. Right. He sure yeah. does. He sure <laughs> sure does that lifestyle. Montgomery Burns isn't out voting for uh, Bernie Sanders. He you know wanted, what I'm saying? He wanted gas. He told me this personally. He wanted gas to be $5 a gallon. So he would make more on the stock market. I said, well, what about the rest of us that, that benefit from $1.88 a gallon gas? What about us? Well, the hell with you all. It's not helping my stock market. I'd rather pay the $5. Yeah. So I revealed that on a show and he lost his mind. I said, well, you shouldn't have told right. me that. Because oh that's how he is. He, you know, as long as I'm making money. What are the- well, that, you know. That seems to be kind of a Republican view to me. <laughs> One of the questions I was going to ask you, Glenn, is you've been you've worked under a lot of bookers. You were in WCW for a long time. Glenn's not that type of guy. I don't you, know what he was doing with these bookers, but I don't think he did. You that. and Pena, I've heard stories. Um, but you were you were in WCW for a very long time. You're in TNA for a good run. Who was, in your opinion, your favorite booker to work for? Your favorite writer to work for? However you want to phrase it. Like who did you think really understood Vince. how to run WCW yeah, the best? Vince. Um, Vince, well, it's the thing, bro. You're going to, you're going to understand, uh, Vince, Vince was the first guy that, that started like, um, and then this is kind of weird. Like I've, I've heard Jim Cornette, like I've, I've heard people that bizarre, you know, we, we can't have writers, you know, you, you have to have bookers, you can't have writers. A, a booker and a writer is the exact same thing. I don't yeah. care what anybody says, because they're the people that are telling you what you're doing on the show. Right. That's yeah. it. It's like, you're going to the, okay, oh, who do, what, what am I doing? I'll go talk to him. Like, yo, yo, oh, it doesn't matter if you call him Booker, or call him writer. He's the guy that's telling you what your angle is tonight. Right. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So, so whatever word we use, you know, that, that doesn't matter. But the, man- thing that, the, the thing that Vince did, and, and and the one thing WCW we didn't we didn't do back then, traditional wrestling. A guy would go out in front of the, you know, he he'd, he'd go out, he'd go out there with Tony Schiavone, and they did cut a promo in front of the people, mm-hmm. and you know, you tell that that's how they told stories. Well, they brought the camera backstage in New York, and you know we, they started filming stuff backstage. Mm-hmm. So when Russo and Ed came to WWE, WCW, that was the first time of the backstage production. Yeah, like we were, the camera now was backstage. Okay. okay, that was the difference. But what that did was it allowed a lot of interactions between characters that you could do backstage, and or have organic meetings between guys that would result in you know you, it's, it's easier to tell stories that way. Yeah. You, you know what I'm saying? Like, where you could just, like, it's just a show. You know, you, the, the guy doesn't have to come out of his locker room and talk in front of the people to, to let his story be told. But, like, a camera's backstage. Two guys can bump into each other, and, and they, they can meet backstage and have their conversation. Okay? Yeah. So, so that's that's how Vince wrote. It's like the, the whole the whole building was open for, like, well, was, was part of the show. It said just what you see in the ring. You know what I'm saying? So it's very difficult to say, like, the, the, the writers I've – I've worked with before because at WCW, we, you just went in a room. They told you how much time you had, uh, who was going over, and you get with the agent. You lay, lay the finish on that. That was it. That was it. if you had an interview, uh, they they tell okay, you, you got an interview tonight. That's it. But with Vince, Vince would write out the show, like we get a whole written version of the show. You'd see what everybody was doing, you know the the, the their verbiage and stuff and that. And you just you just you saw the show like it was a script. You know, but it's, it's, the script could change. You know, like, like, but, but basically, you saw what was going to happen from the time the bells, the, 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 the show up until the show ended. 
the level of effort that it took to write the show is what what what, what, what like uh, Russo, Russo and Ed started doing. That's to what people do today. Yeah, you know. Um, but that's all it is. Is just like you know, yeah. Like I said, it's just, it all. It's it's um, Vince was is probably the best I've worked with since I'm doing that. But um, when it came to like just angles and stuff, and then they and and uh, you could pick somebody's like Kevin Sullivan was very 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 intelligent. Okay. Yeah, you know, like he'd explain like an angle. You, you the way he would explain an angle to you, just like you know, wow, okay, this is very, very smart. You know, so, and um, but but that but that's that's the difference. You know, that I worked. Kevin Stone was very intelligent. Work, working with him as a Booker, but Vin, Vince is the only real writer I ever worked for. You know, okay. When you think what, about writers, what was your opinion of working with Bischoff for all those years? We we, we weren't enemies. You know, he fired me at one point. <laughs> you know, for for not doing the thing with Jackie, but that was a. Uh, that was just a business decision he would have made with anybody he has to do. You know, so I, I, didn't, I didn't hold that personally, or, you know, or anything right. like that. But it just, it just happened, you know. So, okay, I've uh, there was a the revolving door of WCW had a lot of people come in and out to run it. So I was wondering what your experience was with each of them. Um, I, I see what you're saying about Vince. One of the things that I noticed when you look back at his booking career is that everybody had a role, everybody was a character, everybody meant something. I was telling Maya, mm-hmm. my girlfriend, last night that you know Crash Holly, under anybody else's rule leadership would have been a nobody nothing bottom card guy here you know a personal appearance with crash holly in his day you know you'd have people lined up to meet him and i feel like that's kind of been lost i feel like a, a character like the disco inferno got lost a lot of times in the shuffle of you know being a mid card guy in wcw and it would be an under events you know you kind of came up you got put filthy animal for a little bit you had a much bigger story i think uh you had the mama luke's i think as well for a while um trying mm-hmm. to everything that went on. I think Jeff Lane's doing his taxes. Right. No, 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 Those deductions, you know, he's, he's already late. He's going to get, he's going to get penalized. No, I, I was just looking. Al Michaels is, uh, he made a Harvey Weinstein joke on Sunday night football. Oh some my pe- God, some yeah. people are going insane on Twitter. Of course. I'm are not, they really? Oh yeah. my God. What did, what did he say? We got to hear it. We got to uh, he's somebody. Uh, he said somebody had a, is having a worse week than Harvey Weinstein. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there ain't many of us. Yeah, my week ain't wow. been bad yet. Yeah, are so he's you, taking heat for that. Uh, are you still working indies anywhere? Are you kind of out of the business these days? Be other than training? No, I, I, I if they're worth it, I'll do them. You know, I get asked a lot to do, but it's gotta be worth it for me to miss work. You know? Yeah, I, uh, so I still work. You know, and I, I train every Wednesday to super to superstars of wrestling or future stars of wrestling. So, what makes it worth it for you to do an indie these days? What do you look for other than money? <laughs> Just, uh, just money, just money, money. <laughs> money like it, it, I was money, and it's going to be a, uh, a show that's going to have a decent amount. Money and a promoter I've worked for before is going to have a decent crowd. I don't. There's going to be people can, I can sell gimmicks. Nothing, yeah. nothing yeah. worse. I don't care how much the payoff is. Nothing is worse than working in front of a very, very small crowd. Yeah. Uh, I got to have somebody to entertain, and and even if the money's good, you feel like you failed because there's not very many people there. And I've had some promoters that just ain't worth a damn at promoting. And then you show up and then there's 30 people there. And I, I think there's even some that had less. And nothing. Yeah. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't do and shows you like give that. Me $25 so, yeah. and put me in front of 50,000 people and I'd go nuts. I'd, oh, you know, at least you're somebody. Right. Hey. Uh, then I'd ask for a race. <laughs> My first show working for Cornette and OBW had 35 people in the crowd. I recall that. Yeah. I recall that. And so, then you started booking and look what happened. Yeah. I, uh, I booked a lot of stuff for OVW and not Drew Cornette's booking time. He hates hearing he'll that. Never admit, oh, no, he'll, 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 he'll never admit that. He's yeah, never going to yeah. admit that. But yeah, never admit it. My booking in OVW drew more. Don't Cornette, you know so. you don't know anything that you're know, just a yeah. coattail rider? Yeah, yeah. That's, that's, that's the fake news Moron. I get, Glenn. Well, uh, we, be, we better uh, we better wrap this up or we might be down we, to 35 people. Of, uh, well, what in the hell is your problem? What have you done? All you've done is just sit there and push buttons. So who are you going to be telling anyone? Well, I mean, yeah, my Chris has to go to work, and Glenn's probably sick of us by now. He's got to rush. He's got to rush work? that folder to a CPA. He's got to uh, get this thing. Well, done. he's got to get his taxes. Yeah, yeah, well, <laughs> yeah. And, and I, I got to work on this show to get it out by Wednesday. So Glenn, I still got I really a lot of work. Appreciate to you coming on. I'm sorry, your girlfriend so told me you can't get it up by Wednesday. No problem. I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it. I'd be finning here. So. Thank you. We had a ball uh, having that. you, man. Thank you. Hopefully, we'll be able to do this again. We'll have it a little bit more. Well I, th- I think out. in uh, two weeks, your buddy Conan's going to come on. So let him know that we're good guys. Oh, we don't buy awesome. him. I will for sure. Uh, yeah. it, and Chris is really looking forward to that one, too. They're yeah, I'm a, to talk I'm a big Lucha. fan of the old 90s Lucha Libre. So I think you know, I'll have quite a bit to talk about. So Cool. Awesome. Yeah, and that will be released uh, November 1st, that scheduled. 
November okay. 1st that's scheduled to come out. So there we go. All right. Well, Glenn, it was a pleasure. Thank you so much. Uh, have a great night. Uh, I'm sorry about the Falcons. I, <laughs> well, I'm not. I don't. Want to we, it's like it's, like, it's we, October. I'm not worried. I've, it's funny. I'm arguing. Everybody like gets on me whenever the Falcons lose, and, and they're quiet when the Falcons win. It's like, but I don't really, you know. Well, got come, we'll, we'll see what happens in December when we if we're, if we're in the playoff hunt. So. I don't care about it. It's, you know, we're not going to go undefeated. If I lost them in a round one wild card game, I'll be happy. So, right, exactly, right. Thank you so much for coming. Awesome. On. I really appreciate Thanks it. Regardless, you were late. Regardless, you were just hours late. Yeah, it was. Uh, <laughs> sorry, about that. one hour. It was like half. It was a half. Yeah, it was, it was, a, half, hour it was only a half hour, but he stayed extra to make up for yeah, it. He, he, he did stay up, extra, and it was a very good until time. you interrupted. I, us. I really appreciate everything. Yeah. Thank you so much. I right, thanks, guys. Have, Have a great day, buddy. Bye. Thanks.